All right, so um, welcome everyone. This is um, uh, meetup on philosophy group contributions to philosophy of the event Heidegger. We're reading um, part three, the interplay. Um, this is our fourth session on this one, um, about 40 odd pages on part three. Um, we're gonna do our usual uh, round robin of um, first reactions in just a second. But um, first for next time, the next reading is just the whole of the leap, which is about another 50 pages, a little less. Um, and the plan is to do that for um, April 14th. That's four weeks from now, same time. Um, so, and same format, um, just 50 more pages, get through the next section. Um, and then uh, we have several more sessions after that. Some of the sections a little bit later um, aren't as uniform in size, so we'll have some that span other things after that. But for now, it's just one one session, one section, uh, clearly enough. Um, and uh, uh, I think I just start in with first reactions. Oh, by the way, before we start that actually, uh, Pete um, put up something on the website that was useful, um, just a outline of the different passages in our sections where Heidegger talks about the difference between the, what he calls the guiding question and, and the basic question, uh, the guiding question of Previous metaphysics, um, what are beings, the typical formulation of it. Um, he gives others as well. Um, and the um, grounding question about the truth of being with the why, uh, how does being essentially occur? Um, so those two questions um, structure a lot of what's being talked about here as the transition to the other beginning. And this whole section, the interplay, is about those two things. It's about the history of metaphysics and the first beginning and Western philosophy hitherto as like one pole of um, in interplay with uh, the other beginning. Um, so if this section section before is all about motivating why there might be something um, like a modern nihilism or something like that that we're getting away from, um, that's what Nietzsche's understanding of it, at least, um, or an abandoned by, by being um, in Heidegger's terms. Uh, this one is more about the, uh, the first beginning and understanding it and the interplay between that and transition to the new. Um, so that's the basic structure of the basic topic of the, of the, of the section. So we sort of know going in that we're going to get a lot of his history of metaphysics, um, back to the Greeks, um, a lot of stuff on German idealism too, and, and things down to Nietzsche. But it's um, it's a very historical historical understanding um, chapter. Some of this stuff is the stuff that um, Heidegger is probably best known for in his published works. There's lots of you know uh, lecture courses about each of these things. He's also tying it back to his own understanding of what he was trying to do in being in time, which he doesn't think everyone always understood he was trying to do. Um, so um, there's a lot of self-understanding of his published uh, work here. The other thing I'll say before we get to first reactions is because of the nature of this book, he's not really making the, trying to prove his case or make the argument for his case here. He's outlining it. It's more for his for himself. And the places where these points are being substantiated to the extent that they are, are often the lecture courses he's pointing to or the other books he's pointing to. Um, there's connecting tissue here, um, but it's mostly something you have to read through to see what's the whole scheme he's aiming at, what's the whole outline he's aiming at. He's not gonna establish every point for you um, in the way that he might in some of the uh, public lectures, um, which doesn't mean that you will always find everything he says here established in one of his public lectures. I'm just saying this is a, this is not the place to look for a um, an argument meant to be convincing that each point he makes on on the start of the page is proved by the end of the page, something like that. All right, with that out of the way, uh, first reactions, Pete. Yeah, so I, I read the interplay section. Uh, it turned out to be, you know, a lot of the uh, go going over uh, familiar ground, the history of metaphysics. And he's saying, so the interplay is the, uh, you know, we've had the first beginning, uh, Heidegger saying we're, we're, we have to have another beginning uh, and we can understand this other beginning uh, by comparison or the interplay between the two beginnings. Um, but I didn't think he uh, gave, gave us much on the, uh, you know, many cases of the actual interplay uh, between the two. 
And at one point, he says that, uh, you know, you, you can only have access to this other beginning if you've heard the call. So we're kind of back to, uh, I can't remember if it was section one or section two, where he said, you know, it, it's essential to have the call and uh, we, we can't do anything deliberate or willful. We just have to, you know, quiet down and listen for the call. So I was kind of hoping that in this interplay uh, would give us some insight into this other beginning uh, but I, I didn't get m much of that insight in section three. Okay. Um, well, I think there's some there to be gotten, but I, I agree that this is mostly about the, um, history of metaphysics material. Um, but that is meant to be, um, something like motivating for what the other beginning has to do differently, something like that. Um, but, uh, there's a there's a, a a theme of of an of an unthought um, that's meant to be brought out and as um, but we'll we'll get to it. Um, but it's fair to say that uh, he's not. This is not the leap chapter. This is not the new grounding chapter. He's not trying to explain how things look from the standpoint of the other beginning. This is definitely how things uh, look in the history of metaphysics. the The underlying claim here is that having gotten to the perspective of something like being in time or Dasein or something like that, and this other beginning perspective, he can now see what was going on in the history of metaphysics better than people could see what was going on in the history of metaphysics themselves while they were inside of it, so to speak. He thinks that he's got the sufficient distance from the structure of metaphysics to see how it operates, something like that. Um, but he thinks that that perspective is enabled by the other place he's standing. We'll have to see how much that is borne out by the chapter, uh, but I'm just, that's the claim that's being made here. Um, Joe, first reactions? Well, my first reaction is that uh, I'm intrigued by uh, the whole thing I'm reading. Uh, I've fallen behind slowly. Things came up that inhibited me spending time in, in private reading, but I'm following very eagerly, and I'm looking forward to particularly about scanning ahead in the uh, uh, contents area, you know, it's where it's going, going. And uh, I think uh, Pete's uh, uh, layout, his his comparisons that went through the whole text, was uh, extremely interesting, and that's intrigued me even more to, to catch up in my reading. But uh, it's almost like I'm walking through a forest and I'm seeing the trees, but I'm not seeing the forest yet. And I understand this is his notes, uh, his thoughts, and uh, I'm just glad he was still alive to try to bring it together in a more coherent form, unlike Nietzsche, who died and left it all scattered around for his <laughs> sister and others to put together. <laughs> <sighs> right. I mean, I will say that there, there are some parts of this that I consider um, pretty well-written, you know, tightly reasoned, well, not reasoned, it's tightly explained, um, at least history tours, something like that. I'm thinking of the um, section 110 on Platon, that she just calls Platonism, which really the whole history of metaphysics in like one chapter, one little mini chapter. Um, uh, and some of those definitely bear comparison to anything else in his other published work in terms of how, how much you get, how fast, but, um, uh, I understand that you can easily, uh, uh, not see the forest. I'm not sure he wants you to see the forest. I think he wants you to re recognize the reality of the, of the individual tree, but we'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, uh, Dan. Yeah. Uh, okay. I finished it this morning, so I read it. And I, I really like it. It's kind of like you said to me, like he's uh, laying the ground for what's coming and kind of like all his books, like these courses, he's kind of take the same topic over and over again. And now kind of like he's stepping back and he's he's looking what he did. And especially he plays those courses, the like being in time in that context and saying, and then yeah, the 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 great philosophers like he why why he was in engaged with like pretty much he never wrote something except being in time for about himself but he always was tying to a, to a great thinker and trying to explain from that context and I, I really like so kind of making the point why he was doing that and uh, and I also like kind of like that he goes back there to the beginning like first beginning and ties those this kind of like whatever is happening to us to to those basic concept like idea in Plato and uh, 
categories and unity and so on. And it shows how things started and how they kind of like says about Aletea that what he said, like he, he, I don't know, he uses a word like he was succumbed or something like that at the very beginning and how, how this concept like move and transform, but still we are under their sway. And even if we don't recognize it, recognize them in the mother form. And I think what I really like also is like going back, you know, I always struggle like through one of the main struggle that I have like tied to Plato with idealism and idea and see how these things tie together and how they started and how even in mother form, we are still under their influence. Like it's all this kind of what we call mother technology and science and and everything we are doing today still goes back to Plato and his ideas. And that's kind of, to me, it's amazing. And to, to understand that and to kind of to have a perspective from other perspective to see those things. And I really like that. So again, idealism, German idealism and and Plato and ideas. I, I love those things. But mm -hmm. yeah. OK. Uh, are there particular um, questions that you had about the chapter? Was it all clear to you? Were there things that? aren't clear to you about what he's saying or no I, I think everything is kind of clear and I, I I got it and it's more like the first time I redid this book I didn't see it so clear as now but now I kind of see like, like him laying the ground there and summarizing and as you said it's not trying to make arguments but just to, to, to show how things stand and summarize everything and prepare for what's coming and okay uh I have my own questions, but we'll get to them. Uh, Isabel. <laughs> yes, uh, good evening, everybody. By the way, in Massachusetts, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I love the reading. Uh, I did it in different uh, at different times. So at the beginning, I had read already the interplay way back. And then I did the middle reading and uh, the middle of the of our reading. And then I, I just finished the end. Uh, few pages. Fascinating. I just wish I had spent more time on the end because I'm intrigued and the questions I will ask, I'll tell you right off the bat, or rather I will listen for is uh, what he means by transcendence. I, I'm not, I like to little, I'm not, uh, I think I know what it is, but it would be good to kind of go over that. Also, I love the way that he shows that the first beginning is um, not superfluous or to be forgotten, but it is most important and to go there uh, because without a first beginning, there could never be another beginning because other, other, other what, what other from what? So I think that that that's marvelous that he does go back. He loses me in the history of metaphysics because as you know, Jason, I have very little, I don't have a philosophical background. So Kant, Hegel, I said, what is he talking about? little bit Nietzsche because I did and I did a course in uh, Kierkegaard years ago. My only knowledge of uh, Plato and Aristotle is through Dante, uh, secondhand already. But and I did read the Republic uh, when I was a teenager. So um, uh, I, I'm going to get your explanations on, on that or see how that comes about in this conversation. And also the portion when I regret not having ever learned Greek because it is so difficult to read the Greek. I said, what does that mean? And go to the end, look at the dictionary, I said, well, and then go back. And really, I lose, like, for instance, the word idea in Greek. It looks just like idea. I-D. It must be idea. He's talking about Plato. I look at the translation. No, it's look, L-O-O-K. That's what that word means. So I said, my God, well, what, what, what are the ramifications here now? So, um, and about uh, the guiding question and the basic question, I'm sorry, Pete, my computer never told me you, you said anything. I, they usually say somebody commented. So I never read that. So, but I kind of knew what the guiding question was uh, the, and the basic question, Grundfrag in German. I don't want to say guiding question, but I will be all ears. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and I understand very much about, you know, there's a lot of history of philosophy stuff he's appealing to here and expecting people to know how all these schools, you know, uh, uh, link into one another. And he's making, you know, big claims about, you know, how how this led to that and, and this connection is necessary and so forth. And if you don't even know the individual schools involved, it's hard to follow that, certainly. Um, 
but we can we can go over what the the main claims are, are he's making there. We do want to talk extensively about the actual relation that he's laying out here to the first beginning because it's a very complicated one. Um, it is one which is you know um, meant to be respectful, learning from it, you know, redoing some of what it did, recovering some of what it le left unthought, but also overcoming it in various ways. It's a a studied um, conscious relation that he wants to have to the first beginning coming out of all this, which is um, avoiding avoiding several past examples, if I can put it that way. He doesn't want to have the same relation to the first beginning that um, Nietzsche has to Plato, that Hegel has to the Greeks. Right? He doesn't want to make the same kind of uh, claims about superseding or overturning or uh, that sort of thing that those people have. Uh, the relationship he's looking for is more complicated and we have to understand why um but uh yeah we definitely want to talk about that and i agree it's a it's a in a way a more respectful um he's, he's learning things from it etc um jim well i have a lot of questions however they usually get answered so i don't want to belabor it um <clears throat> all of them but the main things i guess i want to uh get clear is the transition to the other beginning um the philosophical task of the other beginning uh I've really, I don't I want to make sure I understand how those things are supposed to work. And this also is a bit of a, a layover from being in time when, you know, he's trying to say history ended in a way of metaphysics, the history of metaphysics ended. And then, uh, you know, I think we know what you and I have discussed, you know, whether or not that's actually happened. Um, I also, we have a real sticking point um, with, uh, in the section where they're discussing the logos uh, in a, to ratio and then intellectus and mainly and uh, because Aquinas's view, he just sort of does, doesn't talk about the intellectus, which Aquinas's view on that is it's more of an intuitive logos than a rational one. And the, that area, he just talks about the, the ratio and I'm like, well, where's the cream filling? I mean, what, how does that work with it? You know, yeah. And by the, and by the way, that, 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 that distinction in, um, in Aquinas, you're right about, uh, parallels the, the one in back in Greek between things like logos and things like no one, right. Um, between intellectual perception and in, in the sense of thinking and the sense of no one, uh, versus, uh, uh, logos and, uh, something like region or discursive reasoning, especially as you get it in Aristotle. Um, so ratio for discursive reasoning and intellectus for something like, um, intellectual intuition, those are the way the scholastics would talk about some of the same things that in the Greeks were logos and noen, but that it's not exactly the same. Um, but you're right that those distinctions are there. He, he talks more about those distinctions in the case of the Greeks and ties a lot of these things to noen specifically. He says that being and thinking is the guiding, is the guideline throughout all of this. So he's not trying to, he's not mostly making distinctions within each of the eras, but he's finding the connecting tissue across all of them if that makes sense. So his that his focus is is not on the careful distinction of how each era used each of its terms of art. It's on um, what they have in common in their sweep that puts them together as one um, history of metaphysics that is a, a ongoing unfolding traceable influence of Platonism or something like that. Um, so it's that's partly just a matter of theme, he, what he's focusing on because of the point he's trying to make. Um, so he's not going to track down every distinction in every era. It would, it would lead him astray from the, the point about the unity of this, of the history he's trying to make. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, on the okay. metaphysics point, um, we do want to talk about the different term meanings of the term metaphysics, because he's obviously using it here as his own term of art and philosophers are allowed to use their own vocabulary, their own terms of art. But right. metaphysics is also used in looser senses than he uh, he uses it here. And there's lots of other schools that would call what he's doing in the other beginning. They would still call that metaphysics. He wouldn't because he's using metaphysics to refer to this particular thing that he thinks ends at Nietzsche. Um, mm -hmm. there, that, that, when I say ends at Nietzsche, that doesn't mean there would be people still doing it the same way after Nietzsche. It means that they're not original, something like that. Um, okay. But he doesn't think that the stuff he's doing, the other thinking, is metaphysics in that same sense because it's not guided by the same original Aristotelian mission that you see in the in in, in Aristotle's book, the Metaphysics, and that's what he's 
tying to that name. Um, okay. But other philosophical schools will use the term to definitely refer to everything Heidegger ever did, <laughs> pretty much. Um, but that's not his own use of the term. Um, we all have to allow philosophers their own use of their terms, their own books. Um, right. And maybe the, uh, one other thing I guess I'd hope we get to, um, and I could be wrong about this, so we may not get to, I get this, he doesn't explicitly state it, but I get the sense, it's almost like we're not really gonna see the truth because people are in the way. Human being, beings get in the way of, of really getting at truth, but that's a conundrum because we can't ever escape the fact that at some point we have to observe it and we have to interpret it. Human beings do that. And it, I feel like, it seems like he keeps like, we were just out of the way. If, if, if our brains weren't thinking yeah. about ourselves, if we weren't, you know, and it, that's almost impossible to yeah, do. But he's not, he's not trying to get human being out of the way. Um, he does say at one point that um, particular set interpretations coming out of the uh, uh, Platonist tradition, he thinks are in the way of the change of thinking needed at the other beginning. Um, and he you know, talks about the, the, how, um, what, what an obstacle that is, something like that. Um, he doesn't think of it only as an obstacle. So obviously things to learn from this history. That's why he's laying it out. Um, uh, he also, um, how to put this? He has a kind of cryptic diagnosis of the, um, um, uh, being in man, not being on speaking terms currently, something like that, uh, that uh, um, there is a, uh, uh, a non-receiving that's only partly due to the encumbrance of, of the stuff in the way. And the stuff in the way is less people or consciousness or psychology than it is um, a history that went in a determinate way answering a different question, something like that. Um, uh, so there is something which he does see is in the way you're right about that general intuition of it, but the thing he's thinking is in the, in that way is some of this history. And the point of understanding this history is by having clarity about it to assimilate it, understand it, you know, learn its lessons. And also in that sense, have it out of the way. Um, and that is part of this complicated relationship to the past that he's talking about, um, and we'll have to talk about the whole complicated relation to the past involved in this whole thing because it's a very historical section, historically minded section. Um, I don't know if that helps. I mean, he, he's not trying to get human beings out of the way. He even says, you know, um, um, uh, being needs Dasein. That's something, something like that. That's one of the things which is different about it compared to the first beginnings understanding. Um, okay. okay. And I'm sure we'll come back to questions, um, but I like. We definitely want to make sure we talk about the different understandings of metaphysics. Uh, Josh. Uh, yeah, I um, thought what was particularly valuable was um, that um, the way that he decides that what's most important to him uh, as um, a continual thread running through uh, the history of philosophy from Anaximander all the way to Nietzsche is what he focuses on here. I mean, he could have picked other, you know, he, it, there are many different ways that he could have decided to come at this. And the way that, that uh, and the fact that what was of the utmost priority to him and importance to, to distill from all the different, you know, sort of events and changes that happened over the course of, 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 of philosophical history was truth is correct, you know, the, the emergence of truth is correctness and the focus on um, presence and objectivity, objective presence. Uh, I think that, you know, that tells us, well, for one thing, it brings up some clarity to what he was trying to get at in being in time for one thing, I think that it, it, it reinforces for me the fact that he, in this book and in this chapter, he never says that he was thought that being in time was in the, going in the wrong direction. On the contrary, 
that it laid out it, it takes us to the um to the interplay right it 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 um uh, it, it's thinking from within the interplay uh, and pointing toward um, the other beginning. Um, and so, um, given that, his 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 you know his emphasis here on on uh, on the, on the um, you know the the or, or his you know um, formulating or, or, or articulating. Um, if you will, the essence of you know um, this arc of history in terms of um, you know the guiding question having to do with thinking in terms of presence, uh, you know, allows us to go back to being in time and saying, all right, now let's see, you know, for to the extent that we might have had questions about what he was up to there or what direction he was trying to go in. This really allows us to go back to that book and say, okay, now you know, let's go back to being in time, and, and and now we let's see it in this light that he was, you know, that when he brings up these issues there, right, that, uh, um, you know, we, we can now reread being in time and 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 see it uh, in terms of, you know, uh, what, um, you know, he uh, how he's going back to it. <laughs> Uh, how he's coming from the future back to uh, back to being in time. Yeah, so I get what you're saying. I mean, and it's it's he refers to it multiple times throughout here. I think it's fair to say that he is he's certainly not abandoning uh, anything about being in time uh, to coordinate nothing like that. He thinks it's an essential advance, and it's a it's a pivotal thing for them. And he is eager that it be properly understood, and he doesn't think it's necessarily been properly understood. He thinks some of that is his fault in places. He talks about some of the limitations that it suffered under. There are places where he does revise some of the things which he says in it in, in, in specific ways. We'll get to that when we talk about what Isabel's is asking about transcendence, because he brings up an example of that. But um but they're those are they're they're nuanced things. They're things around the edges. He thinks the basic thrust of being in time was in the right direction. Um and that um if anything the problem was that it wasn't understood as radically enough or as ambitious enough. It was understood too much as a contribution to philosophical anthropology by, you know, a a diligent neo-Kantian interested in the practical structures of the life world, something like that. And um and instead for him, it's about a um a breakthrough in um fundamental fundamental ontology that is a reorientation towards um what we think of as truth, something like that. And he doesn't think that a reorientation on that scale happened as a result of it in terms of how it was read. And doesn't think he has fully accomplished it either in how he wrote it, um, but he thinks he was moving in that direction, right? So there's no question that the 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 origins of the beginning, whatever, is is definitely being referred to. It's definitely referring to some of the things which began there. I, I think I don't think he would say they're fully accomplished there, but he thinks moving from that towards the question of truth, the essence of truth, uh, period, especially. Um, that's that's the arc he's primarily pointed to here, as you know, the, uh, as this. Uh, uh, this interplay stuff. In 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 some of the next sections, like on um, the leap and the grounding, we'll get to more of those things and how he's how some of the things that he understands in this whole overall overall arc structure are related to his own work. But um, much of the subject matter of this chapter is his best known work, as it is usually read and understood by other people on the history of philosophy and on you know um, how he wishes you understood being in time, something like that, and how how he sees his own activity fitting into this history. Um, so it, it is absolutely a good idea to go back and read reread those things, you know, with these comments in mind and see if it changes what you think of you saying there, right? Um, that's a, a, it's a, it's a, always a good idea to read people three times. <laughs> um, and in this case too. Uh, sorry, Dan has a comment. Yeah, reading, uh, going back, like, so it feels to me like he, he tried to, he wrote Being and Time, of course, was the, for his professorship and so on, but he seems like he wanted to start a conversation and then the conversation didn't start. And then he created more and more problems and more confusion and kind of like Heidegger withdrew and start to have the conversation kind of with himself, like all these books and then trying to like, I agree with you that he nothing fundamental is rejected in being in time, but he's trying to kind of take the project further and it's just talking with himself pretty much, like going back and saying, taking this entire project by himself further and kind of 
bootstrapping himself in a way to to because there is no one to talk with except himself and his past and his previous books and so on. Sure. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously he's got gifted students too, although they're just you know learning or something like that. Uh, it's noteworthy that many of his comments about um, his contemporaries or you know uh, recent past uh, folks that people would associate with his own way of thinking or his own camp get relatively faint praise here, whereas people who would be thought of as being in you know alien or hostile camps are giants that are taken extremely seriously. Right? There's you know great praise for Hegel here and. Uh, damning with the faintest of praises for uh, Carl Jaspers, right? Um, there's uh, um, you know plenty of uh, reverence for the accomplishments of Plato and um, uh, Dilthey is you know, dismissed with this, you know, the wave of the hand or something like this, right? Um, so he's definitely not looking for allies in his camp, something like that, right? He's looking for the conversation happening at the peak that he's trying and the intensity and the and the focus that he that he he needs for it. So that it can reach the real issues, so it can be deep enough for him, and um, he's part of these things where he's explaining read being time this way, being time wasn't trying to do this, was trying to do that. Right? Are he sees people reacting to his previous work without getting the full point of what it was driving at, and that's frustrating to him. But I will say that I don't think the fundamental note in this chapter is frustration. There was a fair amount of frustration in in the uh, in some of the earlier sections. Um, here he's much more um, put it this way. Um, Confident, confidently expository about the history. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the temperamental aspects of that at the beginning. But Isabel has a comment. Yes, uh, I do. In reference to what you were talking about, Josh, uh, is it Josh? I can't remember. Yes, it's about uh, being in time and this work that we are reading. He says that it is a purification, purification, he says. He says, what is developed in being in time as destruction is not a dismantling in the sense of demolishing. It is a purification aimed at laying bare the basic metaphysical position. Thank you. Sure, but I mean, there, there he he's talking about the relation that being in time already has the tradition, and he, you know, there's a whole section in being time where he talks about, you know, the work of destruction of the of the of the tradition in order to get back to the, you know, the the core questions, right? That that word is what turned into deconstruction later, by the way. Um, but uh, from that section of being in time, that's where the word is, is used that way for the first time. But uh, um, he, he's there, I think, again, trying to correct a a reading of being in time that he did not think was an accurate reading because it's not aiming at the relation to the first beginning that he is aiming for here. It was it was more of a, oh, look, the tradition was wrong. Therefore, we can dismiss it. You know, that sort of uh, naive attitude. But uh, Josh? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, you know, in terms of the co background context, I was reading a little bit in the Black Notebooks, uh, the ponderings that were uh, written between the uh, it's section uh, 1931 to 1938. So it was during this period, though, that, though, that was a germination of this book. And um, included in there is that the period there, you know, in, in the early 30s, he's caught up in this fervor of this new Germany and the political happenings. And he's very, you know, he's caught up in this idealism and this faith in sort of the, the youth. And of course, then he's, he's given this position, this very you know, prominent uh, position. I mean, the German university was very powerful at that time. And his position was a very powerful political position. And he had all, all kinds of ideas on how he was going to reform the German university. Of course, it only lasted a year because they discovered they couldn't understand what he was saying. He, he, he wasn't much used to them, uh, you know, to, to, to the political structure, the Nazi structure. And uh, so they let him go. And you can see th this change in his, um, you know, uh, I mean, his disappointment. And, and, and so I think as a background context, in addition to his being disappointed with the general reception of being in time, his hopes for having, um, you know, being a leader, uh, within the German university uh, system were, were also uh, dashed. And so he's left now, not only with no, <laughs> no one who seems to understand his work, but no one who, you know, who seems to uh, connect with him in terms of his uh, more practical ambitions uh, either. And so, you, you know, um, I, I can, you know, I, I can see how all of that, you know, sort of, brought him to the point where he says, well, you know, it's just going to be a tiny handful here and there that, that are going to get this stuff. And that's 
who I'm going to write this for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fair, and it's fair to say that there was, you know, some level of, of naivete and all that on his part. Um, it's always a tiny handful, right? It's not a situational thing that it's a tiny handful. I guess it's, <laughs> it's the uh, it's the uh, um, the the, the Nietzsche's and the and the um, and the Heinrich Heins will, will tell you how perennial that story is, right? Um, but okay, uh, uh, Christian first reactions. Yeah. Um, hi. So I read up to page one seventy one. So almost the whole thing, except for like the last few pages. Um, I had intended to finish it the other night, and I fell asleep and haven't had a chance to come back to it yet uh, but so i'm hoping i didn't miss anything uh you know in the last few pages that was intended to sort of tie everything together but uh, my experience with what i did read i i feel like i finally was able to gain some traction in this book so far um and i think that's probably because you know jason as you said this is to a large extent this chapter is sort of um going back over some well-trodden uh paths from from other stuff but um it did enable me to um sort of get a grasp on what's going on here a better grasp i think and to relate it back sort of retroactively to the previous sections to understand those a little better uh because he's still um He's still uh, using the terminology of this book in this in this chapter. And so a, a lot of things really started to come together for me. Um, I'm extremely interested now, especially to I, I sort of can anticipate what's coming in the next section in the leap, in the grounding. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I, I think that. You know, we saw a Heidegger this time who is um, this is this is not Heidegger just being sort of, you know, cryptic or mystical or whatever. It's difficult to be sure, but it's difficult because the material is difficult. I mean, I, I can I can empathize with what other people were saying. I mean, you know, holy smokes, if you don't have much background in ancient Greek philosophy or or even the whole history of philosophy. And if you're not familiar with the Greek uh, terminology that he's using, I mean, I can imagine this would just be almost unintelligible uh, to someone without the prerequisite background. Um, luckily, I have um, I have a, enough sort of background and, you know, I have a degree in philosophy. So I have a, a fair amount of background on Plato and Aristotle and modern philosophy. So that helps. And I also, over the years, just through Heidegger's help, have finally gotten to the point where I could sort of recognize the Greek alphabet, and I sort of know uh, the words when I see them, you know, techne and pousis and aletheia and all of those different words. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I was able to sort of follow along just, just at the margins with, with Heidegger with this, but I think what makes it so difficult is um, I really do think what Heidegger is doing is he's trying to, he's doing what he says he's doing. He's trying to lay out an understanding of, of, of being, a more proper, a better understanding of being, what he's now referring to as the truth of being. Um, and that's difficult. I mean, we have to be willing to think hard about the ideas, the forms, how those relate to constant presence, how those... Um, how those break down or how they turn into limit cases, how whatness and thatness are related, all of that kind of stuff. It's just hard. We just have to think really, really deeply about it. But I think that Heidegger actually is um, making some progress on this question. And I'm really looking forward to where he's going to go with it in the next sections. Um, and I would, Jason, I would like to sort of get into the weeds today if we can, um, so I didn't quite um, in the section where he was sort of describing how uh, the original Greek experience of phusis or sort of um, emergence, how that gets reinterpreted as techne. Um, and I know, I know it had something to do with the mediation of uh, the forms of the platonic idea, but 
Um, I was a, just a little bit shady on some of those transitions and I, I wouldn't mind just diving into the, to the weeds. So I don't know. That's yep. just my first absolutely. reaction. Yeah, we absolutely can do that. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to friendly as I say, I mean, there are some parts of, of that, which um, we've covered a little bit in the past in the essence of truth book and also uh, um, all things in the Stanley uh, Rosen book on um, uh, metaphysics of production, right. In Heidegger um, and Plato. Um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we can go over, we can go over, we can get into those things that there's a basic story here, which is that, he is telling, he is giving an outline of how he sees the history as having happened, which means that the the operative result of an argument is how it is assimilated by the successors in the tradition, right? It's not always whether or not this argument was cogent. It's not always whether or not this argument was understood, right? The, the, um, something is is experienced in Heraclitus or Anaximander, right? Um, and it is transformed in Parmenides and it is filtered through Plato and it ends up in Aristotle and it's a chapter in the metaphysics, right? And then all of subsequent thinkers get their version of that from the Aristotle version, something like that. And that 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 can result in a, if you want to put it this way, a filtered view of the truth or influence of a position. And he's often reasoning here in that way. He is interested in what was there in the original experience, what was might have been left unthought, you know, why something was used from something else. But it's not, it's, this is not of the form, you know, Plato made this argument, this argument doesn't follow, therefore we should include something else. It's more of the form, um, Plato introduced this concept, it was understood by successors this way, they never revisited this other question, so this thing got burned in, right? which is more of a point about the history of thought than a point about the philosophical argument alone. Now they're related, they're interrelated and, 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 and keeping those, keeping that tension between them alive is, is, is helpful in reading this, but especially when he takes these, you know, he makes these broad leaps from, you know, th this thing is there in the, uh, the way that, um, the Platonic tradition influences the, um, the Christian world through Philo and Augustine. And then you get, you know, this in the medievals and this turns into the uh, influence on the individual consciousness in Descartes. And we get modern idealism, which only becomes idealism with Descartes and wasn't idealism before because of this influence on the individual mind, right? And the, so there's things like that where it, the connecting tissue there is the, is the point, right? He's not saying that Descartes was correct to deduce this thing from Augustine, that Augustine was correct to deduce this thing from Philo, who was correct to deduce this thing from Plato, right? Yeah, to that's totally that's agreed. The road, in, road taken, yeah. In, in fact, sort of the way I was reading it, I mean, the, the major point that he seems to be driving at here is that, you know, in the inception of the first beginning, um, that the understanding of being was in fact sort of projected back upon time but in a way that was not explicit and that was hidden. Um, and that sort of determined the whole rest of the course of the history of Western metaphysics um, from the way he's looking at it. And the way I was reading it was he actually, in some of these sections was trying to explain something about how that might've happened and how, how they may have, um, how they may have missed the boat you know, so to speak, um, in, in these, in the first beginning, in the early days, um, where the temporal interpretation becomes this interpretation of constant presence. And he seemed to be saying that it had something to do with these, these early concepts of, um, how somehow Alethea gets through, through techne reinterpreted. Um, so yeah, I, so, I totally agree, Jason. I, mean, I, I don't think he's, yeah, go ahead. So I mean, there's multiple different angles here. There's the techne angle, which works through knowledge, which we'll get to. There's the conin, the common angle, which works through the common denominator thing, although that's not the original sense of it. And there's the one angle, right? Yeah. He doesn't develop all of them. And each of them is definitely worth tracing through in the actual history, in the actual thinkers, not just in his sketch of the influence Right, yeah. they don't Pretty always compressed here. It's very compressed, right? And and some of these things we we've looked at it in the other books that get into these things in, in, in greater detail. Um, 
uh, you can see times when, you know, he makes the big claim going in, it's a programmatic claim, and you get to the coal face and he's got to make the argument in front of the text and no, it's not actually saying that, right? Um, that happens. Um, and he's honest about that, right? If, if, it, if it doesn't go through, you know, he's engaging with the thinker, he'll give them, give them their, their, their due, et cetera. And, you know, um, in the early Greek thinking book, you know, um, the early Greek thinkers, you know, Aletheia had this whole sunset, you know, right after Anaximander, except when we get to the section on the second Heraclitus fragment, it's all the stuff that Heraclitus actually saw. And there's not a lot of sunset in evidence. The sun is blazing high at noon, right? Um, so th the point is, and that's because he, when engaging with the fragment, he sees things, right? Yeah. Um, so I see something similar going on in some of this stuff about the the Greek transitions. Now, in terms of what's actually gone with Plato and Techne, there's no question that Socrates, Plato Socrates, uses the arts as the paradigm of knowledge, not of being, not of relations that ideas have to being, but of knowledge. He wants to reach for an example of knowing. He reaches for the arts and the arts of the productive arts. And Heidegger makes the point, not only here, he alludes to it quickly here, but he's pointing off to other works where he makes the in, in longer form, that the productive comportment was behind the idea of understanding nature as things which make themselves. They make themselves like art makes things, but they're self-making, but self-making in a techne uh, artisanal way. And, you know, in the, uh, he refers to the uh, thing at the end of the public, where there's a, you know, the, the, the carpenter's relationship to the idea of the bed, right? Um, so th there's a, there's a notion of the, um, the role of the projecting consciousness as the idea before the individual instance exists, right? Uh, taken from the arts, right? And then this can be connected to the uh, point we were talking about last time of something like um, uh, the nature of something is the powers of that thing, right? The, the, it has the power to X, the functional power relations of, uh, of uh, we would say a form, but uh, of a form or a content or an information content, something like that. And, and th that's one of the senses of being is that, that, that power sense. The, the techne model of knowledge for Plato is meant to be an, a, a, model, a model of how you can know something. Plato is very um, aware, and this is a point that Rosen stresses all over the place, that art imitates nature, not the other way around, right? But um, certainly by the time you get to someone like a Philo, influenced by later Platonism and Aristotle, that is somewhat reversed. And now we're understanding, Philo is understanding, um, the universe is a made thing, made by an architect god who has looked away to the platonic forms in order to design it in the same way that the craftsman looks at the at the idea of the bed and the function that the bed must perform in order to design it. Yeah, so we're now Aristotle, it almost seems like it's beginning to get reversed a little bit with the whole hylomorphic view about everything. Right. But the high the the, 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 high, the hylomorphe understanding in Aristotle is Aristotle's keeping those parts of platonic understanding of idea that he, Aristotle, can get on board with ontologically, because he can get on board with things having an outward form. He can get on things having a shape, because he knows where the shape exists. It exists in the material particular over there. In the right? thing, yeah, right. And he, he can also get behind a an abstraction as a pattern in the mind, which is a copy of something, but as a pattern in the mind that exists subjectively in thought. What Aristotle isn't willing to do is go with Plato and and say this abstract thing exists in some between that is well, not simply that is not simply in the mind and is not simply in the outward shape of something. But hyalmorphe is an attempt to have a a version of form that has gotten concrete, realistic, individualized enough that Aristotle can understand. When I say it, can understand. He can intuitively grant that that's the kind of thing he recognizes as actually existing in a way that he's not willing to grant to the forms as Plato meant them. Yes, and right. and Aristotle sees the telos in the things as well, So, which is almost sure. a, going some way towards this reversal of the relation right. between art and nature, yeah. 
Right. So the point is when when you're when you're getting to architect like teleology and and um, the the truth the the truth of the essence of the thing is the is is it is a mental like information content behind them, and you're thinking of that from the standpoint from Adidas point of view of a productive comportment of a shaper or maker that is molding molding a a a, a raw usia a raw matter into the 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 form that makes it actual right that's all very Aristotle. Um, at that point, you you've turned a a forming techne into a model not just of knowledge, but of being, being of, yeah. of how things are, of how substance is, and yeah. and that's kind of what you get in, in in Aristotle's metaphysics is that kind of under, and physics for that matter is that kind of understanding. Um, so Heidegger is not wrong that that thing is there in Greek philosophy. It's just some of that is that way in Aristotle because Aristotle is violently disagreeing with Plato, not agreeing with him on Good some point. of these points, right? Yep. Um, but but certainly by the time of Philo, this has been in part influenced by the other parts of um, Plato, like the Timaeus, uh, and and his you know attempt to put that together with the um, uh, the Jewish biblical tradition. This has been turned into you know. Um, it's become an onto theology too, and it's now a model of um, nature, right? Mm -hmm. Nature is now also viewed as 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 a, a produced creation by an architect creator, yeah. um, who, who creates in the same way that the uh, that um, Aristotle understands um, techne techne action, something like that. So that that connecting tissue, I think, is is sound. It's just that. The, the parts of it which are not necessarily full Plato is some of it comes later, some of it is disagreements with Plato. Plato himself um, thinks of the forms as decidedly not produced things. Yes. Right? Um, they're they're natural, they pre-exist, they're not made by the mind either. And and <clears throat> by the time you get to the moderns, where even the ideas are being made by the mind, right? You you're moving into a subjectivism that uh, Plato would disagree with. And to his credit, Heidegger points out here in, in one of our sections, the Plato he's talking about is a realist, not an idealist like the later German idealists, right? Um, he yeah. sees ideas in things not um, projected onto them by minds. Um, so anyway, the, the point is that th there, are, there are nuances like that. That's just the, that's just the techne angle. Um, there's also the common angle, and that's the, another thing he's connecting here to um, uh, if you can put it this way, a closing off of Aletheia and a watering down of access to being because, <clears throat> why is that? Um, in the experience of Aletheia or of Fusus as uh, arising, appearing um, of, of something out of unconcealment into, con you know, out of concealment into unconcealment, which is there in that word and is there in the Fusus word and is there in the sort of poetic understanding of these things. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And is there also in the mythic understanding of these things that you get um, before the, um, certainly for the Scratics, um, you, you, it's already there, and it's sorry, it's still there in some of the thinkers like um, Heraclitus or an, an Aximander, et cetera, not just in the the sort of poets and philosophers, uh, mythics, whatever. Before, the point is, in all of that, you are looking to an immediate experience, an immediate noetic experience of the individual um, rising, appearing, of being itself, something like that. You're being phenomenal. You're not being um, inductive. Right, and here's the thing you can contrast it with. Um, I experience a whole bunch of beings. I look around for the lowest common denominator, and I call that the thing which they all have in common. And uh, so I read off from all of them the one sign or note that my intellect tags them all with, and I decide that that thing which they all share must be the being thing because they're all beings. They don't have everything else in common, but they're all beings. So whatever that thing they're all tagged with, that's the being thing. So this is an attempt to derive the content of the meaning of the term from its domain of application. It assumes you already know what beings are. You already encounter beings. The beings are apparent to you. You don't need an understanding of what being is in order to be able to tell well, not this thing or that thing is a being. It's a thing, so it's a being, right? They all are. Um, and you just need to find the denominator. And that's the, no that's the notion of common he's pointing to here when he uses this Conan uh, uh, word. <clears throat> now, Conan was a term of philosophical art already in Heraclitus, but it was not used in its lowest common denominator sense. 
the common that Heraclitus referred to was the common world across the minds. It wasn't the common. Public. That's right. The public. The he he would say that the um, uh, same men react to 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 what is in the common, but people with private opinions behave like men asleep, as though they lived in private worlds. Right. So the the separations of the minds from one another, or the or the pooling into the common world, is what the common was about in Heraclitus. It's about the, put it this way, the relativism question or the solipsism question. It's about the the being with structure and being in time, right? Yeah, um, sure. The fact that we're always already with others, right? That that sense of common was what Heraclitus was using it for. And the place where it's used to greatest philosophical effect in Platonic Corpus is in the Theotetus and the stuff that um, Heidegger himself focused on in the Essence of Truth essay. And there it's precisely used to argue against the um, the man is the measure understanding of um, that. Uh, Pythagoras. That truth, exactly, that truth yeah. is perception is, is what's being argued against. And the, the argument against the truth is perception is that um, the mind has access to the common in a way that is not through the perceptions. And the examples are what we would call the mathematical and the, and the logical, right? The mathematical and the logical elements of of our statements and their and, and their truth and necessity is a common that is not in the perceptions and is not in the individual minds, but that the mind that the, that the soul has access to, that the noose has access to, and this is used to show that um, uh, truth cannot simply be perception, right? In the in the in the Theotetus, um, but the commonness there is again across the minds, not across all the entities. It's not factoring entities to find something, it's finding a a a pooled truth, a truth that we share, right? Um, so, and in all the uses of just, of all of the, not uses, all the places where Heidegger is criticizing the way in which he thinks that the notion of common causes metaphysics to go down the path of treating being as a lowest common denominator, He's always thinking of it in the terms of across all of the individual instances, not across the minds. Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I noticed too in one passage where he even was uh, talking about how this, and of course it's related then to the notion of objectivity, which arises later in this notion of unity. But he was, I think there was even one passage where he was talking about the just the experience of a being a singular being over time and its constant presence yes. in a sense you're unifying all of those momentary instances Absolutely. into a being so even yes even without making reference to other beings it's already correct, there. correct. um dan is common we want to uh, there's more to talk about on this on this um uh the constant presence being and also about the the hen the one but uh dan go I, I I really like what you said, and I think this is also the the move where the like a priori and transcendence happened, like in, with this induction and to common and so on, and and Heidegger is criticizing this by by the, end of the yeah. He's definitely criticizing the movement of, of of the induction form, but the place where you find that you do find thing, arguments like that in some places in Plato, but they're all just explaining how the many ideas are subsumed under the one idea. Um, it's not usually about the finding being across all the beings. The place we find being across all the beings, this notion of the com the most common is actually in, again, Aristotle in the metaphysics, right? That's the place where this most this um, most most common concept uh, idea uh, uh, is advanced. By the way, it's not advanced because it is endorsed by Aristotle to core, right? He has, you know, he's, he's asking the what are beings question um, in a subtler way than that, and he's going to get at, you know, he's going to eventually come down on the side that be, you know, being is substance, right? He needs a full substance for something to be a being, and he has all kinds of, you know, categories for things which aren't yet full beings, something like that. Um, but that's, you know, Aristotle particularly. I'm just saying that he, he, when he's discussing the way other people have talked about it, have talked about being, that's where this, you know, being is the most common, is most is, is most used. Um, it's fair to say that the uh, uh, Christian mentioned the, the the objectivity move. It, the later in Descartes, um, af, along with the certainty move, we do get the objectivity move that does make an appeal to agreement across the minds. Um, the the primary qualities of the things about which there is no subjective qualia, and therefore there can be complete agreement, right? 
you don't have, um, there's no objective truth about the sensation of the color orange, but there is objective truth about the, you know, how many nanometers of light that uh, it's vibrating at, right? Because the, the second is something which can be, you know, a across all minds instrumentally out, instrumentally ascertainable thing, but the other has a subjective quality of component of experience that cannot be generalized, cannot be made public, cannot be made common, right? So the objectivity move does in does go back to this common across the mind moves. That's 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 definitely still there. So in this move of truth towards agreement, move of truth towards the common, move of being as this, you know, factored operation, right? There is what Heidegger is seeing is um, these are all attempts to, um, in one way or another, um, operationalize, um, reduce to a formula, reduce to a uh, a, a doctrine, uh, reduce to a method, uh, something which originates in a, an actual experience and intuition connected to that experience. And there's nothing wrong with having those methods if you track what you're, they're doing, but if you're using them to understand how things are, you're abstracting away from the how being essentially occurs, right? The how being essentially occurs includes the fact that it appears as qualia to minds in time, all these other things that are part of that structure. And if you take that structure out of them, what's going to be left is not going to be all of being in the phenomenal sense, right? And, and sort of that's that's the direction of this criticism is going. That's why he's saying there's something about Aletheia which is closing down, right? These, these moves to try to... Um, turn the thing into a rational doctrine that be written down in a text and transmitted from one person to another without them having to go back to the coal face and have the experience themselves, so to speak, without them needing to touch grass. All they have to do is read the right book and you know accept the right opinions or follow the right reasoning, right? What's going to be lost in that is all the things you can only learn, you know, standing before the tree in bloom to put it in the in the uh uh what is called thinking terms, right? So uh in the interplay, right, the, the move to the other beginning is is about trying to recover some of those uh, things lost in the history of metaphysics about how being essentially occurs, right, and 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 the focus away from what are beings to how being essentially occurs is meant to put it back in that phenomenal immediacy, and also back into that um, it is an appearing to Dasein in time, something like that. Okay, um, I want to talk about a little bit about the transcendence things. There's multiple things going on there. He mentions multiple meanings of transcendence in the sec little section on that, and uh, uh, I think uh, Isabel in particular wanted to know, you know, uh, what he means by it. He gives multiple meanings for it, and the critical thing to notice there is that he is backing off a use that he gave to it in being in time. In being in time, he says that Dasein of itself is transcendent because it is always outside of itself. It is ecstatic. It is, you know, it is already an outside, right? So Dasein is the transcendent thing in being in time. It's the thing that transcends, the transcendor, right? Um, which is a, a deliberate um, heightening and deviation from what, what Husserl, his teacher, right, would tend to say. Uh, Husserl understood transcendence as just the Transcendence in the direction of the of the intentionality of the mind uh, as the object intended by the by outside of the mind, outside of the consciousness, it meant to be in the transcendent reality, not meant to be in your thoughts about it or your positings about it or your uh, truth claims about it, something like that. Um, but uh, in being in time, Heidegger is using uh, transcendence of Dasein in a in a more radical sense than that. But here he's backing off that. He's saying. There's a problem the way I used it there, because he's saying that in in the whole history of metaphysics, there's a reason why uh, transcendent realities keep coming up, and the reason is people the in that tradition people are always looking for explanations of things which come from the nature or structure of how being essentially occurs in terms of other beings, right? It's always it's being centric thinking. So if you want to know how something happens in, in, the, in the tradition of what are beings, you find a new kind of what, you find a new kind of being that behaves differently from other beings. It has new characteristics. It is a transcendent being, right? And this transcendent being with its new transcendent characteristics 
can explain some uh, facet or fact about how being essentially occurs that would not otherwise fit into the rest of the theory, something like that. So from Heidegger's point of view, um, a, a philosophical theory spawning additional transcendent objects is a sign that it is um, introducing epicycles and dark matter and trying to explain things that it should have gotten right the first time from the phenomenal evidence, right? And and he doesn't he 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 recognizes that what he did in being in time when he made the move he did on Husserl's um, notion of transcendence by calling uh, Dasein the transcendent thing is bad. It's bad rhetoric. It's 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 going to confuse people about wh where he's actually trying to go. Uh, compared to past understandings of, of transcendent. And so he says here uh, in the section on that, that that whole way of talking about Dasein as transcendent should just be dropped. The right way of thinking about it is that Dasein is always already in the truth, period. There's no transcending needed to get there. That's where well, it starts. He's, 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 not, he's not sort of retracting that basic understanding of Dasein in the earlier works as Dasein being already outside of itself. He's just sort of retracting the terminology, you think, that he, he feels the terminology was confusing. The terminology is, is effectively conceding to, to the previous thinker is something like the point that um, Dasein was, uh, was a mind locked up inside of itself like a box and needed some transcendent function to get outside of itself. And that's the whole point he's denying. So don't grant them the term. Don't yeah. call it an operation of transcendence. Just say... Um, it's always already in the truth. It's always already plugged into the world. It's always already outside. Dan? Yeah, I agree with that. But I, it's also one thing here in that sentence I was struck by. He he put something like, to me, the emphasis is on that says that the representation of transcendence in every sense must disappear. So it's yeah. it's kind of the, the representation is the key word to me there. Like in the... Uh, you're, you're right, but the... the, the... Right. Um... The immediately it's preceding, right? right? There, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, however, since the understanding is in turn taking me through in projection, transcendence means to stand in the truth of being, of course, without at first knowing this or questioning it, right? Dasein originally endures the open of unconcealment. We cannot in this strict sense speak of a transcendence of Dasein. So yes, he, say, he says after that, that, that every representation of it um, must disappear. But the previous part about we cannot in the strict sense speak of transcendence, that's a self-criticism, right? He spoke of transcendence and he shouldn't have. It, 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 it's, it's not accurately called transcendence. So he, he is correcting his, his, his language from being in time, right? Uh, you know, that's, and he's going through, this is all the different meanings of transcendence in the, in the history. And, you know, he, he gives criticism of his own alongside the others. Um, but yeah, the, the, the point is that in, in being in time, understanding Dasein as the transcendent entity was a way of, of uh, learning that uh, what he is trying to talk about when he's talking about uh, Dasein is not a Cartesian, I, I, I think, self, right? Um, and, and to that degree, it's helpful to someone in that old way of thinking to, to recognize the, the distinction. But it's served that purpose. It's, uh, it's now just going to mire people into thinking that they it's you're starting from a locked up inside dan i i think you used to say like way back that he's addressing the Kant, the kantian kantians people mm -hmm. the, and he's using their language and it's, this is such, such central term in kant and he's using it in, in a radical way to to kind of hit them over their heads and they don't get it <laughs> and then he says it was a bad move for me to yeah confusing yes. the people yes. in this way yes so i mean now he just wants to drop it right um He's in a way he's saying, in the strict sense, there is no tra transcendence because there is nothing which is being transcended beyond or away from in the first place. That the 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 whole and yeah, I get it was sort of yeah. a pedagog pedagogical use of the term earlier, but he's saying yeah, it really was a bad move to call it that because really there is just this opening and there is nothing which right. is which is being transcended. And, and, and the point of that is he's trying, because what he's trying to do is get people to go to the phenomenal evidence themselves, right? You don't actually want to get them there by the 
way in which it follows or seems to be steerable to, towards as an insight from a previous terminology, because terminology steering is exactly not phenomenal looking. Yeah. Right. Um, it's systematic. It's system thinking, not evidence. So, I, I, I think this is. He, he's right about this. He's right that that was a. You know, I I recall being impressed with that when I was reading it being in time, and it you know it 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 helped me see what he was saying when he used that language. It did the pedagogical thing we're talking about um, uh, for me, but I think he's right here that the, the the point can actually be made cleaner than that, and it um, it's more forceful if you don't have to make that make it with that connection. Um, the, the third, sorry, Josh. Uh, yeah, um, I think that's related to a point that people struggle with. There's a tendency when you talk about an in-between or a difference, um, one always presumes that there has to be beings that there's a difference between, that there has to be beings that there's uh, a transition between. Um, and uh, transcendence can imply that to most people, if you take away uh, these poles and say, well, you know, you don't start with the poles and then the, the difference is sort of secondary or kind of a glue between two things that, that pre-exist the glue, uh, then you arrive at a notion of design, which is already already right there in as transition rather than uh, as, as mediation between uh, you know, presupposing. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I get what you're saying, but I mean, even even more radically, he he doesn't want there to be glue because he wants to. He's trying to use the da dash sign to say that da sign is a form of sign, and it's part of how being actually occurs, right? Well, occur, and, right? Occur is transition. <laughs> it's already a, a kind of bifurcation. Uh, hmm. Yeah, a bifurcation without Maybe. needing. Yeah. It depends on how Holmes. temporal being is, but <laughs> uh, so so uh, Isabel. So uh, there's so many things I don't understand. So as you know, I'm also a polyglot, as I was saying before, and I've gone to a lot of other sites on YouTube. Very wonderful work by other nations, but uh, and on this particular point, as I gather. Design relates to being by transcendence. Design transcends how exactly was Christian was saying he opens design, opens beings in this way or another. And I open this being. Oh, it's a pen. I I have I have opened this being. And then this particular philosopher that I am uh, one of the many, he says that uh, being relates to design by horizon, uh, Dasein is the horizon of being, well, for what it's worth. Thank you. I think the horizon is a different notion. There's horizon in world and there's horizon of time, but um, Dasein is more the place or site in which being happens than horizon. But this is just terms of art things. Um, but yeah, so uh, the point, I was just trying to get to the point of how he's revising his previous use of, trans of transcendence here. Uh, getting back to the point for Christian for just a second, I realize we should get into the actual didactic things in a minute because we're just, this is basically just finishing up first reactions, but we're mostly finished with them. So um, the other term that Heidegger points to here as part of this um, transition of the first beginning towards metaphysical understanding away from the phenomenal understanding of Fusis and Aletheia is hen, one, right, uh, oneness. And he talks about identity becoming paradigmatic for uh, being. Some, something is a being if it's a one. Something is a being if it has identity, if it has self-identity. So, and, and I think that he's right about that. This is something which is coming out of the Parmenidean tr tradition and it's still definitely pl pl present in Plato. It's present in Aristotle as well, sometimes to a lesser degree. Um, there is a lot of, let's come this way, logic work about ones in Platonism. Um, and some of it uh, by later standards, rather slipshod logic work, right? It's, uh, it's very, um, 
metaphysical logic work about ones. And the reason is ones as they conceived it is not transparently a self-consistent idea, right? Um, there's you know famous passages in, in Plato's Parmenides where you have these long trains of reasoning about you know what follows from uh, the one existing and the many only appearing to be and vice versa. And uh, famously, all of these tissues of reasoning issue in contradictions, right? And it's meant to be aporetic, showing that um, you can derive a contradiction from any of the different possible assumptions. So at least a seeming contradiction. Um, and this was part of the tissue of tissues of reasoning that the Parmenidean schools, um, Zeno of Zeno's Paradoxes fame is also from that school, uh, like to spin out as part of their uh, training in dialectical reasoning, right? Um, what did it purport, pur purport to prove? Something like the slipperiness of logic about anything less than being, something like that. Um, uh, they they were not treating logic as a uh, a method so sure and 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 and, uh, and trustworthy that it would always lead to uh, sound conclusions, but that's partly because their logic wasn't yet codified Aristotelian logic as we know it today. Right, it was dialectical logic, and and there was a lot a lot more slippery introduction of unstated minor premises that just seem plausible, and and from our point of view, later point of view, I mean. But why do I bring this up? Because the most famous of those little tissues of contradiction are about things like the one existing, right? Um, and how how would you arrive at a contradiction from the one existing? And the answer is because it gets, uh, you you get it to be affected by the existence word and the existence word is a time word and the time word has past, present and future, which is three modes and three is more than one. That's how you get it to be contradictory. It can't be one if it exists in three times instead of one time, right? Something like that. So the notion of something that admits of no multiplicity is the same as something which admits of no existence if to exist requires time. That's the actual reasoning in, in that you encounter in the uh, in Plato's Parmenides about the one. Okay, so Heidegger is clearly um, interested here in the fact that this um, school of metaphysical thought is um, following chains of uh, uh, logos reasoning in ways that are leading it farther and farther from intuitive experience and the phenomenal, and towards uh, something more like um, doctrines and logical doctrines even about identity and and so forth, right? He's not wrong that that's going on here, right? He's not being uh, exhaustive or subtle about uh, about the ways in which uh, this one stuff is being used. But what's the point of all this? The point of all this is uh, the way in which he brings up the, the role of one and identity here is um, too pat for the way it actually happened but he's not wrong that the focus on the one, which has its own huge history in 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 Western metaphysics and theology, right? Um, that's a real subject. It's a real metaphysical subject. Um, he's not doing it full justice here, but it is part of this pulling away from the phenomenal and the in timeness, because ones aren't really in time as when they're understood abstractly enough, something like that. Yeah, that's that's good. And yeah, this is a, a really subtle issue. Um, and I think I think it's important to qualify, too, that, you know, when Heidegger's talking about these these deep sort of metaphysical principles about, you know, I'm, he's, he's also referring to the fact that um, even in Aristotle, like a, a being is a being. I mean, it's a it's a whole it's a one. It has the category of quantity applies to it. Um, and I think he thinks there's implicit in that is all the danger associated with um uh calculability and and all of that stuff that that comes later but um i think it's important to qualify too i mean it's not as if heidegger is just outright sort of simply rejecting like oh this is this is the wrong way of looking at things um sure. he's he's sort of um i mean he in a lot of ways he's he uses that idea himself right i mean that dasein is always a whole, you know, and that um, there is, you know, and being in time, he's constantly searching for the the whole of Dasein, the unity of Dasein. Um, 
So it's not it's not even that he's like rejecting these ideas. He's just mm -hmm. somehow pointing to the insidious nature of once you get this idea of sort of quantity or oneness, it leads down this this other path of and then gets associated with the I and the I think. And right. so I think I was, he's about, just, to, I was about to go to that last part because I mean, he, he does tie this into the one into the identity stuff, but the identity stuff really only becomes what it is for. Modern, modern German idealism. Once that I, once once the identity is the I identity of the self, and that's really only in the moderns. It's not that it's not there when when it's not there in the ancients. It, it may be there it, there by uh, it's certainly there in a way by Leibniz, right? Um, uh, Descartes, borderline, right? But it's not it's it's not the way you know a Parmenides or a Plato is thinking about the one, right? Um, or a Philo for that matter, right? Or a Plotinus. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. He even says explicitly at one point, you know, the the suke, the psyche in, in Aristotle is not the the I think of of Descartes or Kant. It's very yes. different. Yes. And there's some things in here where he's going through the connecting tissue of Platonism to um, through the medievals to the early moderns, where he is actually quite fair to what's the, the stack, psyche, zue, noen, right, all actually was. For, for for those folks, for the uh, he's what I'm trying to say is um, there's a history and a development there, and and the 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 more distorted versions of it actually come quite late in all this history. They're not distorted early. They're actually you know reasonably sound early. Um, we can talk about all the other ways in which there's things which maybe sounder here than he's sometimes letting on. But uh, Josh, comment? Yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, so I can see uh, with. Descartes' introduction of, of you know, the, the cogito you have, that becomes the absolute uh, basis and the absolute grounding uh, for uh, not just subjectivity, but also objectivity. And prior to that, in the medieval period, it's God. It's the absolute grounding. Is there, in Plato, what would, uh, would there not be, sure, the absolute would there be an Plato absolute? The, idea, the yeah. absolute grounding in Plato is the idea of the good, and then in Plotinus, it's the one. And there are some who can, who put an equal sign between the two, like uh, and there's others that put a different sign between the two, like Dionysus the Areopagite. But uh, there, there's a history of those of those understandings of that highest um, in the history of the different kinds of Platonism and Neoplatonism, if I can put it that way. Um, but the original in Plato is uh, highest idea is the idea of the good Agathon. The Agathon is the uh, Epikania Usia, the what is beyond being, right? Um, and he talks about that multiple times here as well. We can talk about what that is like, but there is a an, a seen need for a concept of the beyond being in Plato, and what he puts there is the idea of the good, and Plotinus later has one higher than that idea of the good. Um, mm -hmm. But tr truth, truth, idea of the good, one. Those are the kinds of things that wind up at the top of the Platonic or neoplatonic, and, that, and, that, and that's views. and that's and that's grounding beings in relation to other beings, according to Heidegger, right? He he, he thinks yes. He, he he's saying that be, be the ground of beings is thought of as being, um, and he thinks that that um, that being is thought of as being like a being, right? So at times they'll say it's not just a being, but at other times he says, but they're treating it like a being. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Heidegger can sometimes be, um, go this way, um, uh, maddeningly unwilling to take people at their word on some of these topics. <laughs> <laughs> like he, like uh, uh, um, you know, um, uh, Plato will say, you know, this this idea must be beyond being, and you know, within one page of commentary on it, Plato is saying that that thing is being. Um, it's, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that he must have thought he must have meant that right and the point is when you take someone else's fundamental metaphysical schema and you stick it into your own um it's entirely possible to do that in a way that distorts theirs rather than understands it correctly um but w w a lot of this is, is a little bit far afield i mean some of this is stuff we we talked about in the essence of truth stuff there are ways in which the role played by the good in Plato is played by time in the structures that are laid out, primordial time, the structures that are laid out by Heidegger, especially in the late parts of basic problems of phenomenology, 
um, uh, the and that relation, that almost equivalence relation of structure between those two those two um, uh, topologies, if you want to put it that way, uh, is actually explored a little bit by hinted at a little bit by Heidegger himself in his Essence of Truth essay. Um, he recognizes that the same reasons why he Heidegger sees a background horizon of time upon which uh, beings are projected, that need for that background horizon is the same need that, that motivates Plato to have a good that is beyond the beings, right? Um, I would go further and say that um, uh, this is not Heidegger, this is me, but um, Heidegger will tell you that that structure of that projection on time is a thrown projection onto Dasein's essential possibilities. And Dasein's essential possibilities are uh, structured by, whether Heidegger likes it or not, uh, the, the domain of uh, longing and the pole of good and bad. And so um, uh, Dasein's possibilities and good are more correlate than he might let on. Um, so if someone wanted to be a completely um, uh, Platonist uh, Heideggerian, they could probably get some of these things to uh, line up with one another more than Heidegger might let on. But Heidegger definitely wants them to be quite opposed to one another. He thinks that the idea of the good idea closes out the possibility of direct experience of the phenomena involved in how being essentially appears. But he's thinking that because he thinks that it's a it's a kind of a making a being out of it reification that is turning it into a being that's going to move it around like a counter on a board and that that's going to close off anything like um, intuitive phenomenal um, experience, something like that. I don't think it needs to do that, but he's certainly right that it's just danger of it doing that. Um, Josh? That's, uh, I was I was thinking about your comment, uh, your re reference to temporality as a background horizon, uh, yes. particularly the word back background, um, which I thought that was interesting because, you know, I, I would think of it more in, in terms of um, not in terms of a background to anything, uh, because background seems to me gets us back to the notion of a grid. Uh, that you place things on top of, and then you get, you know, it, it throws you back into sort of, you know, the, the Husserlian notion of a horizon of time going all the way back into the past, you know, as a kind of a, a linear, yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah, I'm not uh, thinking, I'm not, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not thinking in terms of a grid at all. I'm just thinking in terms of the, um, there is something about the way in which the objects of attention and intention that we think of as the beings phenomenally arise and appear that is a shining forth within. And the within in which they're shining forth is what Heidegger likes to call time space, right? There is there, there is a within in which they arise and appear. And that within within they, which in which they arise and appear, just structurally, is a background horizon in which they arise and appear. And that hasn't changed since Anaxagoras, in my opinion. So you have a within and you have an appearance. Um, it's, it's the within a kind of a, um, how does, uh, what, how does- I'm just, I'm just, I'm just contrasting yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 the shinings that the beings do with the background in which they're doing it because to shine is to shine out in, right? Yeah, but then, okay, but then- Sh um, shining, I Shining has the notion of a differential surface of attention where there's a heightened. It's implicit to the notion of shining that there is a, a differential between the sh what shines and what does not shine. And that requires there to be a contrast and that requires there to be a background of what does not shine. So implicit in the notion of arising appearing is the concealment out of which it arises and appears. I think this is all straight Heidegger. So would you be able to translate that into his way of putting together the three axes? So you have, you know, the future it comes back, uh, the, uh, you know, the world is projected from the future, it comes back to the future, you know, to the present, and then the, the past 
is defined out of what comes from the future. So the three ecstasies are all tied together in an in, in, interdependent sort of a way as a single kind of a moment. Um, all, how of, does all, that, of, all of the yeah. all of the ecstasies of time that uh, that uh, occur for the the there occur in the there. All all of them have this um, in presenting character. They are they are uh, they are out of the different ecstasies of time, but they are out of it. There's a dasein there's a dasein directed arrow in them, so to speak, um, uh, and vice versa. But the, the, is it the, the is back, it directed from, from the, back, the future? Is it directed from the future? No, it's not. That's not the direction. The the no the the, the background in which all of that is happening is this time space idea right yeah. which is not just space and not just time and it's not just future and it's not just past it's just the open it's the uh the realm of the extension of truth in which anything like any of these events can transpire right okay. and that notion of that open is what he means by that time space and it's also what he means by our time as a the time in that time space sense as being a horizon on which beings appear. Sorry, Isabel. Yes, uh, I'm. I'm going back to the good. I'm sorry. That's why I raised my hand. And but what you're talking about is so interesting. Though I hope I remember what I was saying about the good, Plato, and the good. And uh, the Heidegger does pull away from that. He uh, he doesn't espouse that at all. But mm -hmm. isn't that, Jason, because the good is a value? And does he not? Does he not criticize value? In fact, he does away with the concept of value. And isn't that why so he's super if, criticizing if Nietzsche? The, Thank you. Fair, fair questions. Um, if the good were value, I would criticize it too. Value is a uh, uh, an idea that is a thicket, and for reasons which uh, are well explored by Heidegger and his criticisms of Nietzsche. Um, uh, but uh, Plato is not Nietzsche. Plato is not a value theorist, and Plato's good is not uh, is not the Nietzschean idea of value. The Nietzschean idea of value is that something. Uh, ontologically prior and fundamental in the human being, in the human being's will, has needs and drives, posits them as things that it needs, and throws them out as values for its own action. There is an out, there is a created from within the self, created from within the will, notion to value as a posited thing that's implicit in the word value itself. There is none of that in Plato. For Plato, the good is as objective as the stars. Dan? Yeah, going back to, do you agree that, like, for example, the background in being in time is just time, the ecstatic time, and while here he's moving yes. to, to time space? Time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. In, and in, in, oh, sorry. In, in, both, in both being in time and, and the lighter portions of space problems of phenomenology in particular, primordial time or tempor the, the second version of, of uh, temporality, right, is presented purely as the horizon. There's no mention yet of time space. He separately has things about the spatiality of that sign, which he criticizes here himself as not being fully formed yet. So he clearly is revising that to try to update it. But the, the you're absolutely right that in the earlier works, it is just stated as, as, as time or temporality that as that background horizon without the time space idea yet. And if I can go back before we leave transcendence, after you, what you said previously, it struck me now like there in transcendence that he says the point E on page seven, 170. He said that he defines, uses transcendence as this move from a known to unknown. And he kind of negatively associated with the ontological difference. And I found that strange that he just clarify like he said, I use it wrongly in being in time, and here is kind of using using transcendence for for the kind of even in a negative way for the ontological difference. So kind of he's bringing it back in a so strange. I I take e. I mean I understand what you're saying, but I, I take e to be saying here here's the problem with transcendence. Transcendence is always trying to take people from the familiar to the unfamiliar, but it's doing so by introducing uh, new beings 
And that's exactly what metaphysics tends to do. And uh, his whole point is, yet all metaphysics is overcome in the transition of the basic question. He does not want to go there anymore, right? He thinks that the method of positing new beings behind the beings behind the beings as the structure of things is, is a way of avoiding phenomenal evidence. It's a way of avoiding grounding. And, and that's exactly the er problem with Platonism from his point of view. He's got lots of things to say in favor of the, you know, turning around and orienting on truth and living in truth things that you also find in Plato. But the, the part of Nietzsche's criticism of Plato that he most takes to heart and keeps is he doesn't like the true world is behind the world is behind the world is behind the world tower that cuts us off from evidence. Josh? Uh, I notice your, your use of the word evidence, which is, of course, you know, comes from phenomenology, but yes. I would think that would be one of the concepts that Heidegger was uh, got away from. Uh, sure. I mean, what, what does it imply to say that something is evident in a, within a phenomenological analysis? Well, for Husserl, um, you know, it, it's mode of appearance of an object or subject. Uh, and doing away with this notion of subjectivity and objectivity, I think Heidegger also does away with the notion of evidence. You're, it's a fair fair point. I mean, evidence is a, is a, is a term that uh, you know uh, theory of science uses a lot. It's a it's a it's a uh, a, a term positivists like, and, and he doesn't like positivism, right? So um, uh, it, it's fair to say it's not the term he would probably reach for. He he would talk, he would probably speak of you know. Uh, uh, experience or intuition, or he would just say what the content of the thing was uh, without otherwise characterizing it. Um, but uh, there's no question from my point of view that um, something like a theory of noetic intuition is what is going on in all this. And we saw that in the whole book on what is called thinking, that this um, something like direct noetic intuition is um, uh, her evidence for Heidegger. Um, it's 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 ground truth of, of of metaphysics, and when I say er evidence, I'm I'm translating from I'm translating for the uh, the uh, analytic philosophers and positivists in the room, right? I'm saying that this is the, the he has the same motives for wanting to do that that um, people like Popper have for wanting to keep the universe open, right? He thinks that you're only going to make contact with truth. If you have something that is a experiential grounding, and he uses words like ground all the time for this, is this notion of if is this notion of uh, of being that we had in the Greeks grounded? He asks, right? Did they ask the question about whether or not this this was true? Right? Did they even could they even ask that question? Did they have a place to ask ask that question, or were their theories hanging in the ether? Right, those are the kinds of criticisms he makes of these of the whole structure of metaphysics, honestly. Right, and I think that that's if there's a if there's a basic thrust of being in time that he thinks that too many of the neo Kantians missed, it's that they didn't take him seriously when he said, "I'm doing fundamental ontology and I'm talking about what actually is and I'm talking about the actual truth." Right, my my favorite example of that from Heidegger is the uh, the standing before the tree in bloom example from um, uh, from what is called thinking, where it just makes that. To me, blindingly clear that that's what he's talking about. But I, I understand that other people have other interpretations of all that. He certainly is not a positivist. I'm not using positivist language to explain him because I think that it's uh, his his own terms and that criticism is fair. Josh? Would you say that Popper advocates a notion of truth as correctness through, uh, through falsification? I'm sorry? I heard would you say that through falsification? Didn't you the first part? I think. Yeah. Oh, would, would you say that Popper advocates a notion of truth as correctness, um, as opposed to say Kuhn, who would not? Which uh, I'm, I'm just throwing fair. that up because I, no, I, I get I it. I, I get it. There, there, there yeah, may, yeah, yeah. Popper is not a Heideggerian. That's that, that's fair. He's also not a positivist. Um, the um, I, I think that Popper's notion of truth is not simply uh, operational. Uh, I think he's more expansive about that um, as a philosopher. He will say separate things about, you know, this is what science is versus what he thinks philosophers do and what he thinks truth is. But he is, if there's if there's two things that drove Popper to distraction, it was being confused with the positivists and people who uh, 
pretended that only science was truth. Those those people drove, drove them to distraction, right? Um, and his reason for doing that is for, for both those things was he he wanted there to be um, uh, open mystery and unknowns and people are allowed to think about them and uh, there's truth about them even when we don't know it. And yep. none of these things can be reduced to um, uh, formulas and machines with cranks that don't need minds behind them. Right. So, yeah, so I think I formulated that bad, uh, badly. I think that what I was getting at was that I think what you're saying is 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 that uh, noetic evidence, or in the way that you put it, is not is 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 a different thing than correctness, right? Absolutely, it's absolutely yeah. different from correctness. Correctness is correctness is in principle something that you can program a computer to verify for you. Um, and because of that, it's something which is designed to be operational in the absence of an observer, operational in the absence of a mind. Practically speaking. So, tr tr and I think that that's Heidegger's fundamental criticism of truth is correctness is it's this move towards method and logic and all these things, which are all designed to take the uh, take the Dasein pole out of the truth equation. And he says, it won't go. What you get when you take that out isn't truth anymore. Does that make sense? Uh-huh, yeah. These are all great questions. Uh, I, I realize that you know we've we've been organically starting on the uh, on stuff, which is which is great. Uh, it, it's great when it's this lively and people have these. Um, I wanted to draw attention to two things at the very beginning of the of the section. Um, one is um, I don't know if you noticed the basic disposition at the very beginning. He talks about basic disposition, and he's doing this in all these different chapters. He talked early in the very first thing about how disposition is a, a means of attunement. It's it's one of our you know uh, ways of having access to truth. If we're just unsettled about something, we should pay attention to that, right? This is you know all the way back in the in the in the intro section, and in the previous when we were talking about the um, going to this way problems of modernity or the things that drive us batty about the world, whatever. Uh, it was diffidence. It was restraint. It was. Um, um, being pissed, something like that, right? It was, it was, uh, it was a, a, a held back negative emotion kind of thing. And here he says the basic disposition is pleasure. The basic disposition is pleasure in the in the mutual surpassing of the rivalry with the first beginning, and that is extremely important to me, because what this means is he is not doing any of this because he hates the tradition. He's not doing this out of, you know antagonism towards Plato if he wants to take Plato down because you know Plato done done him wrong right the underlying motivation here is not is not anger it's not distaste for the tradition it's something he thinks he can see that he is trying to see farther it is an emulating mutual surpassing he has tremendous respect for the Greeks in the first beginning he wants the modernity to live up to its to that measure to live up to that standard and um, if it's falling down from that, as for all the sort of reasons we saw in the previous chapter, you know that that's lamentable, but it's also correctable in principle. None of this is about trying to burn the thing down. The underlying disposition here is, as he puts it, pleasure in the mutual surpassing, right? Pleasure in the interrogative and the reciprocal surpassing of the beginnings. Philosophy is fun. Philosophy is interesting. Philosophy is alive. And if you're not getting that, you know, this chapter, the, the transition from the last chapter to this chapter hasn't jarred with you enough, you know, morally speaking, right? There's a difference in tone here that's part partly there in the confidence, but it's very easy to take all the negative things he says about people in the tradition as, you know, crapping on them, so to speak. No, right? He has immense respect for them, and that's why he, you know, also throws in these, you know, sections about, you know, the, the mountain range of the great thinkers, and you know, uh, uh, what it means to let them stand there and to, you know, uh, recognize them as towering over us, and so on, right? And he, he, that temperamental aspect of this is extremely important to me in terms of just understanding the relationship he wants to have with the first beginning, because not everybody in the world is like that. There's plenty of people that want to have a, a, a you know change change uh, the first beginning because you know they have a very different fundamental disposition in, in a chapter like this okay 
Okay, Josh, comment on that? Or I don't know if your hand's still up from last time. Probably still up from last time. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was still up from last time. Go, Dan. Yeah, it's, that's interesting. It struck me also, and especially since like his critics usually associated like even these days too with deconstruction with something negative and with something that he's kind of like his his guy who's tried to take everything down with hate and rage and so on. And it's and I was struck that he he's using pleasure, and I think that's why he's kind of, like you say he's engaging all these big names and big philosophers with it. I guess he was pleasure. It is pleasure to to follow him. Yes. I mean, and I, I mean, I think there are places in this chapter where I can detect, you know, when he's talking about some of his contemporaries, I can detect some um, frustration. I can detect some, you know, contempt. Even at times, he talks about how, you know, what do we actually manage to do since Hegel? Well, some useful scholarship, but it's honestly, it's mostly blather, right? Right? And he'll, he'll put it that way, right? And so, and that's partly meant to be self-criticism, not just criticism of other people around him. But the the, the point is. There are places where he's going to be, you know, uh, still a little bit salty at times. But the underlying thing, and when he's talking about, uh, you know, the achievements of Hegel, who you could easily just, you know, ha have uh, a, a big dislike of. No, he's 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 saying that, you know, H Hegel uh, explained the different ways in which I what idea has meant through the history of uh, philosophy in the phenomenology of spirit well, right? You know, he's he's and he, he lays it all out. Right. Um, so there's there is that, as he puts it, this this um, uh, the reciprocal surpassing the beginnings, the pleasure in the reciprocal surpassing. Um, the next thing I want to point out is in the very next section, he talks about how historical this is all going to be. And we need to understand what that historical is. Um, the first point I want to make is that there's two ways of reacting to founders. You can react to a founder by listening carefully to everything they say following their footsteps, living in their laws. You can react to founders by saying, wow, they founded something. They list didn't listen to anybody and they made up their own new laws, right? Both are ways of emulating founders, but one follows them and the other emulates them. He's definitely in the second camp here, right? That's the way he's thinking about the Plato's and Aristotle's of the world. He's not thinking of the Plato's and Aristotle's of the world as people whose, opin whose uh, opinions and doxography must be mine so that we can you know, uh, agree with them and be like them. They're people whose activity has to be understood and appreciated for what it was so that we can try to do the same ourselves with equal originality. That's the way he's thinking of the relation between the other beginning and the first beginning, right? And I put it to you, that's not something that doesn't just arise in philosophy. It's a, it's a general attitude towards um, achievements of the past. Is Are they things you just live inside or are they things that you emulate uh, and, and regard as models for your own possible possibilities of action he is definitely in the latter camp um, here. Yeah, Jason, um, I even noticed um, he was using this term inceptual thinking, which in the first part of the book, he seemed to sort of be reserving for just his own project. Um, but he was describing um, the, the first beginning in terms of being a kind of inceptual thinking. Yes, yes. All founders do inceptual thinking in a sense. Right. Yes. Dan? Yeah, that, there is one more in the very first sentence there. He says the necessity of the other beginning. I think by the end of the book, he's not so sure that that would be necessary. It's more like a, it's possible. It's like the God, the last God may, I don't know, elude us or will not save us or whatever. But there he says it's the necessity of the other beginning. And I guess I, I'm not sure what, necessity means there is like it's a confront the, the confrontation is necessary or the, the other beginning is is necessary so it's you're, you're right to point it out but what he says is that the, the the interplay is about the confrontation with the necessity of the other beginning so the the a confrontation with something in heidegger means this is just terms that you get used to from lots of heidegger right a confrontation is a place where a decision is going to be made it means it could go differently but a confrontation is when someone wrestles with the full set of you know circumstances around the event or the the state of affairs and uh, wrestles with them and some decision occurs that settles it and that moves the possibilities forward right that's what a confrontation is it's not a confrontation if it's just you know a debate if it's just sniping if it doesn't decide anything but a confrontation is a place for uh, of decision Right. 
And then this is a confrontation with the necessity of the other bidding, beginning. So the other beginning, the other beginning uh, appears necessary. Is the other beginning necessary? Are we going to treat the other beginning as necessary? Are we going to decide that the other beginning is necessary? That's the way I'm reading that. Whenever he says confrontation, he's, he's really saying, are we going to decide that? Now, he may have a very strong opinion about which way that should be decided, but he has enough of a attitude towards how human possibilities in history actually unfold that he's not going to pretend that what's governing it is anything like a necessity in the sense of a logical necessity. It's going to be a decision. And history unfolds as decisions created by confrontations that are result of the deep assimilation assimilations of the whole of the past, right? And so you're, you're right to bring out, you know, there's a question of, of you know, how, how necessary or contingent is any of this? I think at bottom, a lot of it is, almost all of it is contingent, but he has, as we've talked about several times before, sometimes these strange senses of destiny in these things, but he doesn't pretend to know those things. You look at the um, 160, the Holderlin Kierkegaard Nietzsche section, right? This is perhaps where he's closest to this, right? What hidden history of the invoked 19th century occurred here? What law of motion of what is to come is being prepared here? He's raised his questions, but his questions he doesn't know about, right? It's the kinds of things that, uh, uh, kind of thing before he does not have a calculation to make, he has a blank wonder, right? But the, what is that blank wonder about here? That you have people as, as uh, different as uh, Holderlin, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche that all share, you know, some connection to, you know, a, 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 a next here. What do they all have in common? Um, they're all various various ways of not being Hegel, is the way I would put it. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but this is, and why, why does that belong there, right? Because what is Hegel? Hegel is the idea that a system is going to tell you the, uh, the course of history culminating in its necessary end, as its necessary culmination. He's going to give you a deterministic unfolding philosophy of history in which the logic of ideas and the logic of history uh, dovetail with one another and lead to you know the necessary final overwhelming development. And here we have some hidden law of motion in the 19th century uh, governing what what happens with these you know uh, three anti Hegel thinkers, right? So he's he's not going to come down on the side of Hegel on questions of necessities of the other beginning. Is where is where I'm coming out on this. Does that help, Dan? Good question. Okay, so I talked about the founding business. Um, uh, I want to go to eighty three for a second. Did people notice the not a Buddhism, just the opposite remark? Did anyone wonder at that? It's on page one thirty four. Dasein is, is the grounding of the truth of being. The less that humans are beings, the less that they adhere obstinately to the beings they find themselves to be, all the nearer do they come to being a sign. Not a Buddhism, just the opposite. Very. You said that was 134, Jason? Page 134, oh, section 83. Okay. The last sentence. Isabel? Uh, for Buddhism, isn't that because Buddhism... Uh, is there is this thing of being against or opposite, and that's exactly what he is trying to avoid. That's why he say he says the other beginning, because um, this has to be a totally different uh, approach, a totally different uh, view for that he is uh, expounding. I believe so. Buddhism, although very popular, is out. Thank you. Well. Yes, it has to be other, and therefore Buddhism might not be other enough. That's certainly true. But the way in which it's an opposite of a Buddhism, I put it to you that the way it is an opposite of Buddhism is he may be taking a very caricature view of Buddhism here, but Buddhism, as he's, as I read him to be saying here, is something like that the, the world you experience uh, is an illusion. And uh, this is the this is going to be just the opposite of that. This is this is meant to be a renouncement of metaphysics that is going to convince people that they're living in the world 
and they're not living in an illusion. Yeah, that he is, says that just in that in that line before he says, um, "Yet how could the metaphysical renouncement of beings be possible uh, without falling prey into nothingness?" And I I take yes. it sort of the critique of Buddhism there. So that's sort of similar. The you know Nietzsche accuses Buddhism of sort of being a, a just another form of nihilism, or he calls it sleepy at one point. So I, yeah, right. I took I mean, that. And, I took and, that as right. He's, he'll have he'll have very similar prejudices about Buddhism that Nietzsche had. Nietzsche, by the way, understood Buddhism through the lens of Schopenhauer. Right. Um, yeah. uh, Schopenhauer, who who agreed with something like the renunciation of the will as the moral thing to do, um, uh, and and you know had a, a kind of Buddhistic quietism as the as the as the the, the moral attitude of pessimism, and that was uh, uh, Nietzsche's uh, um, main thinker as a as a as a young man in terms of the philosopher who influenced the most as a young man in university, etc. But he broke with that aspect of him violently, certainly by the time he was twenty five or twenty six, right? And and you know wanted to reverse it completely. But the the um, to to renounce the will as uh, as as the the quietest way that one reaches moral perfection was sort of the Schopenhauer teacher that the, the teaching of Buddhism that uh, Nietzsche got from Schopenhauer, not from Buddhism itself. I'm saying it, it, in a way, Schopenhauer was almost closer to something like a Vedantic philosophy than than Buddhism, and so uh, yeah, maybe or Nietzsche's even, view on Buddhism, or even a Tolstoy, honestly. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, when I read that passage, I I was thinking of Master Eckhart, and it's it's like you know, like sometimes Master Eckhart and they people they 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 said that he and Buddhists are the same, but it's kind of in Eckhart, it's kind of this kind of make a space. Don't like the the beings are not disappearing, but you you kind of you keep them at your arm length and you you treat them differently. While in Bud Buddhism is this kind of everything melts down and disappear, and it's 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 more like a yeah, it's like being they don't disappear they you, you you treat them differently you you make a space around you 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 don't treat yourself as a being something like that okay i, I wanted to bring that up because i thought that you know that the the buddhism reference, reference could easily be cryptic there and it could easily be that you know uh and and okay. we could say too that heidegger's motivation for speaking in terms of withdrawing away from beings is much different than the the Buddhist motivation. So, like for yes. Heidegger, the reason he's bringing this up is because he's trying to get us away from this sort of uh, onto theological orientation of the guiding question by understanding being in terms of beings, like as the as the yes. being of beings. Um, and I, he mentions in another passage something about the the basic disposition of questioning as a kind of withdrawing away from beings and i yeah i think he's just cautioning us that he doesn't mean it in the buddhist way yes yeah. that's fair that's fair uh the, the 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 withdrawal from beings is not uh, a retreat from the world the withdrawal from being is paying attention to how uh, truth essentially occurs rather than the particular beings that have appeared something like that or even theories about what beings are um we should probably talk a little about the guiding and guiding question and the uh and the and the grounding question because I know Pete you know gave us all a wonderful primer on it and we probably all have it by now um, that is the, the concept not the primer um, uh, hopefully both but uh, uh, we should at least cover it right so the 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 guiding question is uh, uh, what are beings toti on it's it's the it's uh, he's treating this as the uh, the basic problem that the basic question that you get uh, throughout metaphysics um, the formulator of it is Aristotle. Um, He's calling the whole formation Aris, uh, metaphysics because of Aristotle's book of that name that asks this kind of question. Uh, and, you know, it's what is the meaning of being as what do the beings share as, you know, uh, what are the beings, something like that. That's all the guiding question. And why is he calling it the guiding question? Because it, it guides people to understand being only by the way that it appears in beings. That's the first thing. So it, it is a guidance towards understanding being, but only in that way. And then he also says that um, in the in the history of metaphysics, in, the, in this sort of philosophical structure, living inside metaphysics, people get their own sense of what it means to be human from what uh, 
what beings are said to be and how they appear to people. So when I say appear to people, I mean how human beings serve truth, how human beings understand things, where they are in the whole, what kind of things they are. Um, all of that gets grounded on a, a an understanding of being and and the beings uh, uh, that we live among. And the characteristic things in metaphysics from his point of view on that are um, that uh, human beings are thought of as beings themselves, uh, and also you know the um, uh, an, a, animal natural, or, so, sorry, rational, right? The, ra the rational animal. We're, we're, we're the the animals that reason. So we we have we have we're animate. We have souls. We have reason um, that distinguishes us from the other animals. That's our specific difference. Um, but we think of ourselves first as um, beings alongside other beings that happen to be living beings that happen to be. Uh, distinguish from the other living beings by being the, the, the ones that, that can reason and have speech, something like that. And that that sort of um, Aristotelian uh, uh, genus and species differentiation of the beings guide to ourselves is the self-understanding he's connecting to history of metaphysics. You can also think of just the, the typical platonic power of um, we're bodies with souls, with spirits or minds, right? All of that is 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 the um, uh, connect to the structure. In in his Nietzsche lectures, he goes through a bunch of the history of uh, history of metaphysics, and he lays out this little structure that's like a form that each of the different positions in the history of metaphysics has to fill out. He's an early structuralist in this way, right? And and he'll say they all have to tell you um, what it means for something to be. They'll have to tell you what what uh, how is truth possible. What are human beings like that they are capable of, of, of whatever that truth was you said was po possible, this or that, that much? Um, and they'll have some version of uh, how being occurs, although that will be the thing that they're le least conscious of, something like that. And every metaphysical scheme will have to fill out answers to that. And he'll go through and tell you this is Aristotle's answers to that, and this was Descartes' answers to that, and this was Hegel's answers to that, and so on. And they're all fitting into that structure. So this is part of his evidence that this is a single, um, go to this way, a single intellectual formation. We would later say a discursive formation. He's this is again, the original version of that that we get later in, in, in structuralism applied in the social sciences, but here it's being applied to history of thought. Um, and metaphysics is kind of the original one of those structures. Anyway, I'm, I'm pointing out all of that as the, uh, why is it the guiding question? What is it guiding, right? The basic question, on the other hand, is how does being essentially occur and being with a why? Um, how, and he also calls this the question of the truth of being and why those correlate with one another. The truth of in front of something for Heidegger means the appearing into unconcealment out of concealment of, right? The truth of X has the, has the, uh, the accent or the meaning of um, historical occurrence of the coming to know of X. It, it's not just truth of X in a, in a abstract realm of a, the way a, a Wittgenstein might have it, right? Uh, the truth of operator puts something in time and includes its revealing, right? So the truth of being and how does being essentially occur, the arising appearing of being, these are all formulas for the same thing. Why does he call this the grounding question? Because he thinks that the they're the ground of how anything like a being can appear in the first place, right? So there is there is the the way in which that happens, um, and asking the question of the way in which that happens is a uh, to him a a more basic truth question, which from his point of view can ground the other understandings. The other understandings they leave that out aren't grounded. They don't have a um, they're not tied back to the uh, human history and human life of where the appearing occurs, right? But if you do tie them back that way, then you can uh, unroll the same questions that metaphysics tries to answer in the in the other direction. First, from how being essentially occurs, then to what uh, what are we if we are the place or site where that unfolding occurring, uh, you know, transpires? What appears to us, right? Comes, you know. Uh, afterwards in, in, in all that. Uh, Josh? Um, yeah. Um, 
it, uh, the way um, I, I agree with what you said, um, the way I look at that. So the why, uh, um, the how question, you know, how does uh, being appear? Um, of course, that that can't be a theoretical question because then then it becomes a general category. Uh, oh, the how? Well, what is the answer to the question? Okay, now we know how it appears. Um, the the radicality of the how is you in asking the question, you're inserting yourself into the question. That is to say, the how is always this how now. It, it, it there's there's no generic general answer. Oh well, now we all know we can you know we we can Google it. This is how being you know. Um, it, 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 it's always the event, the occurring of its appearing. Right. In other words, it, it's an activity. And the yeah. activity is always this activity now. And it's always a new activity. It's always a different activity. It's always a unique activity. And so um, history for Heidegger, I think that, you know, uh, he understands it in terms of from this now, which is always a new now, which is always this unique occurring. Um, and then, you know, and then thinking back from that or out from that rather than right the the, the, the metaphysical uh, traditional way, which is to reach that in immediate now through uh, an already ossified or already presupposed framework of some sort, right? The guiding question. Do you, right. do you agree with I'm, that? I'm, I'm mostly uh, can, can agree with that, but you're starting to answer the question that I'm just formulating. But yes, the the, <laughs> the, the first parts of answering the question are um, how does being essentially occur? The answer is once strangely. Right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> once strangely, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to be like, you know, uh, every time it happens, you know, it, it happens this way, right? We're not looking for that because it happens once. Right. And uniqueness is part of how being essentially occurs. Right. Yeah. With an X with an X in it. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's got mystery. It's got it's got unknowns. It's got you know, decisions. It's got uh, it doesn't have repeatable universality of a transportable widget you can put down somewhere else and get five cents return on. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's it's more like, you know, um, the car crash you're in in the next minute. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I'm saying it's you know it. Yeah, so uh, yes, but this is all about trying to ground these things back into history, and that's why I I like to say that the um, one way to think about Heidegger's understanding of the other beginning is if the if the first beginning gave mankind to, the mission to understand the truths of nature, the other beginning is wants wants to. Um, give mankind the mission of understanding um, unique history, right? Understanding unique happening, unique history, the unique, the individual, the personal, um, the once, um, the irrepeatable. And uh, that's something which is easily lost or left if you only look for the, the universal the patterns are always the same, right, et cetera. Um, and I think that there's plenty of thinkers before him in the German academics 19th century I'm thinking of that already knew that if you wanted to understand anything like human history in its actual spiritual insides, so to speak, you needed to be able to deal with that once individual, irreproducible, personal, you know, that's how history goes. Right, history doesn't go like um, uh, uh, billiard ball physics. Right. Um, so I don't know if that helps, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, so the so the truth of nature derivative from that unique, strange, only happening once history. Would you say well, that? Or, I mean, or... I don't know about derivative. The, the 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 part the part that has a history is man's career to discover those truths, the uses man has made of those truths, those go back into the history. And the one way to think about Heidegger is he wants the, the, um, the kind of endeavors we worry about in science to happen inside the human history as the actual story. The story is the human story of our history and science is something that happens inside of it as we try to understand some things that happen to recur. 
right? Um, mm -hmm. That's different from uh, science is the world we live in and um, uh, the uh, history of what happens to us is an uninteresting chapter over there in the fiction section, mm -hmm. right? Dan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting related to this. I think you hinted a little bit like basic versus leading question, also being versus being is like how how human are understood. If we if we move from uh, beings like human is animal rational, is what's it's dust, it's stardust, it's information processing entity, it's it's subject, it's and then if we move from the other perspective, like Heidegger, then you have human is Dasein is it's the place where the the true of being happen is is the steward of being and so on and it's it's interesting if if depending how you move it's how you understand human what what human means and so on yes and i uh, from how do i agree with that the only refinement i'd say is depending on which question you ask right uh sorry see you see you jim um okay uh all good um I want to get to um, the uh, the propositions on this is an eighty uh, section eighty six one thirty seven. What, what this is meant to be like a capsule. He's going to give you histories of metaphysics that are so short you can't believe them, and he'll give you uh, longer ch long chapters that are um, so sweeping that you're impressed, right? So uh, by the time we get to one ten, we'll get a you know chapter on Platonism that's you know eight pages long and is like the most condensed history of Western philosophy, right? But here he's he's gonna give you instead takeaway formulas, right? Of the things which he thinks metaphysics is always uh, always uh, saying or doing. So what is he saying here? Be beingness is presence. This is, this is the claim that, and this is not a claim that he says metaphysics has taught itself. The whole point of this is this is why this is an interplay chapter. A lot of the things here being said about metaphysics are things that he says he, we, can now see about metaphysics because the standpoint of the other beginning has arisen for us. We can now look at what, what the people were doing in metaphysics and see some of what they were doing, right? And that's this thing like being his presence. You're not going to find you know, um, a chapter in, 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 in Aquinas where he says, why being his presence, right? This is a this is an after the fact historian coming later saying ah I see what was the common thread of all of this, right? That's why this is all a very historical exercise. But that's what this uh, being is presence, and then being with the why is self concealment. This is very important to understand here, right? When he's going to say that how does being essentially occur, the fact that uh, one of the ways in which it essentially occurs is a self-concealment. That's the X part. That's the mystery part that Josh was talking about, right? It, it doesn't occur as something obvious and always already known. It doesn't occur as explored territory. It doesn't occur as cleared field. It's It, it occurs as the wilderness, as the background, as the chaos, whatever, um, in which the, those sorts of things might arise. He says, beings have the priority and what, is, what does that priority mean? It means that, that they have a priority of attention in metaphysics specifically. Beingness is subsequent for that very reason is the a priori. This is partly just the point about what, how the Kantians arrive at the a priori, but the point is first there are beings, beingness is the factored thing where you say, what do all these beings have in common? Um, that is a subsequent operation, is an operation we do as an abstraction across them, but they first have to be there for us, for us to find any denominator that they have in common. And that means that the beingness is always a derived thing. It's not the first, it's not the prior thing in metaphysics. And he says, for that very reason, a priori, why? The, the point he's making there is that the that what you get in country and moves to the a priori is, you know, the the the, nece the, the, the necessary conditions for something to be this way or something like that is what you, how you arrive at, um, uh, you know, understanding something as being prior to something else. It's a, it's a, a necessary condition for and the point there is that this factoring business is uh, looking for a deeper structure. It's looking for a, uh, a, 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 a more universal structure, but its way of doing that is actually always dependent upon the prior experience appearing, you know, uh, 
the truth event that all the beings have already appeared to you, right? So he's, he's pointing away from the ambition of the factoring operation, which is to arrive at a more fundamental underlying truth, a more universal truth. And he's pointing to the actual historical sequence of operations, if you get me, right? The sequence of operations is first the beings appear to you, then you do an operation of abstraction, then you have an abstraction and you pretend that it's an a priori that was already there, right? But, okay. Um, all right. Um, the thing which is being contrasted here with all this, the, he mentions the his, history and the historiological. I think we talked about the historiological last time, but I want to make sure that this understanding of history and the historiological is clear. What does he mean by the history? He, what he means by history is when something matters for this, all this history of philosophy stuff, when something matters for the history of metaphysics or something matters for the history of ideas, something matters for the unveiling of, uh, of truth to man, something like that, then it's part of history. If it's, you know, uh, you know, what kind of pottery they used in this beakerware culture in, you know, this century in this little area of Eastern Europe, right? That's historiography, right? They're necessary facts for understanding some things, but they didn't change the world. History is about the decisions that change the world. They're about where the world goes. It's the plot of the story, right? So history is the plot of a story in which major decisions are made about human thought and you know how human beings relate to the whole, something like that. And that's what gets to count as history. And if it's not part of that story, it's background detail, it's set design, that's historiography. Is that decision, is that distinction rather clear? Okay. Josh, is that a comment again? Um, yeah. Uh, um, would you also say that the historiography, the distinction might also involve um, treating the past um, by filtering it through a, a, a present template used to understand the past? Um, and then, you know, if does, you think about, yeah, go ahead. He, he does say that historiography does that, but he also thinks that history properly understood does that. H history that matters is the part that's actually alive for our actual future decisions, right? It's the, it's the part that's still alive for us, right? The Platonism that matters is the Platonism that's still structuring how we think, right? Um, and and it, it's not, you know, the, the thing which is, um, lost in oblivion has no further effect. It may have some, you know, it may be have some secondary effect on on you know how we got here and part of the our our, our, our thrown past or something like that. But the, the the history that the history that matters is a history that's still alive, and it's still alive because there are actual future decisions on the main line of the plot of the story that turn on it, mm -hmm. right? That's what so for, so for example, for history. Go ahead. So for example, if we go uh, and we visit Pompeii and we treat it historiographically, then we're treating it as a done deal, as an event that's already been written about and analyzed, and we're and we're understanding it through that dead, uh, you know, already past analysis. But if, instead, if we if we go through Pompeii and we understand it in relation to what is absolutely vitally relevant to us right now, where it, it is still alive for us because um, the meanings that we're gathering from it have never really you know, faded. And the, in the same way that he treats the histories that he ana uh, analyzes, right? And then Aristotle and Plato, you know, they're, they're not historiography for him because that we're, we're still living in a certain sense um, all the way up through Nietzsche, right? We're still living in the, in the present era for the most part in that history. And so it is current and alive and relevant still rather than this canned dead history. That so we can so I, 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 I yeah. agree with the, the distinction, but the, 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 the Pompeii example uh, makes it appear as though, and this may not be your intention, but as though if we, if we focus sympathetically enough on what's you know, common in our lives, we would find some, you know, uh, some meaning there, which we might be able to, or maybe just there's you know, some natural disaster threatening us and we have some thing to learn about it. That's not quite what's going on here because it's not, an, not about trying to um, mine the possible field of historiography for what could still be alive and meaningful. The, the, the focus 
on these issues is there from the burning issues of the living present, right? So I, I, 138 is an example of this, right? Uh, he's talking about these previous philosophers and these are just ways these things are related. And he says, leading always and only to knowledge of the one unique matter that the essential occurrence of being requires the grounding of the truth of being. And this grounding must be carried out as docile. This is a man on a mission. He's got a focus. There's one thing that needs to happen for the future of Western philosophy. We need to get this being thing straight. We need to get this Dasein idea. We need to make this next step. And these other things that lead into it matter for that happening. There's a one unique occurrence that this is gonna happen or it's not. And he's not looking for all the ways in which corded wear can be meaningful. He's looking for, right, what matters to this project? What matters to this next thing that must occur if Western philosophy is to continue to grow as it should? Something like that. Dan? How about like if we make this world more technological and when he says something like, but where the danger lies also the salvation power like, so it's kind of like an indirect <laughs> turning this, like when we technology make this world more and more technological and ourselves we kind of we go go away from history but there is a there is a salvation there somehow somewhere well in you're talking about this th things where he talks about the possible rising of saving power and the question concerning technology pardon me um yes but it's a possible arising right um and the reason that it's possibly arising is because um uh it it can heighten our sense of plight something like that um uh, knowing that you're in a, a in a, in a dilemma is a is 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 a first step towards uh, uh, understanding that anything might be done to to, uh, uh, to to address it or redress it, but he's beyond the needing the wake up call of there's anything to address. That was the previous chapter. Now he knows not only he he now knows that the thing needed to do the addressing is this new beginning, uh, which is going to be the overcoming of uh, the limitations of. Um, guiding question traditional metaphysics, something like that. Christian? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you think it might be fair to say that um, Heidegger thinks what he's doing is distinguished from just historiography in the sense that um, he sort of views history as having this sort of continuity, uh, maybe just in the sense that like Buddhism would not be a part of uh, the history of the West, right? It's not, it's not part of it it's not continuous with it it has no bearing on it um and what heidegger is doing is um the fact that he even has to tackle this relation of interplay the fact that he has to make a kind of reciprocal rejoinder to the past and engage with the past in that way even if he thinks he's on some level he's making a fundamental break or instituting a a new inception the fact that he has to relate to the past that way is very different than historiography just sort of standing back from the outside yes. and cataloging yes. uh, events that happen. It's sort of, it's not just right. about things right. uh, the way that That's, historiography the, the, might be. I mean, Nietzsche has some, you know, um, places where he talks about this, I think <clears throat> others, but there, there, there are plenty of bottle washers and button, short, button sorters needed in science, right? In order to, you know, get all the uh, all, all of the things uh, arranged and plenty of necessary raw materials and production, uh, you know, um, of intellectual stuff, right? Happens, there's a lot of work a day, whatever, but that's not his focus. Um, and uh, y yes, the, the, the history stuff is the stuff that he thinks is, is live this way. I think he also just thinks this is, this is part of, why don't we put this? Part of the subject matter of the uh, other beginning is moving to this historical terrain where these kinds of questions are the actual living things, the actual live things, right? Um, he's a much more historicist, historical philosopher than Plato, for example, right? Uh, and even if you know, uh, uh, you know, Aristotle is going to start everything with what predecessors said on the topic, and is going to try to make advances in it and so forth, and he's going to be consider himself part of an ongoing, you know, activity like that. That's still not the same thing as what's going on here, right? He he thinks that you can go through uh, the stuff that is happening from Descartes to Hegel and say, yes, actually Hegel summed all this up correctly, and actually Fichte was an advance beyond Kant, and actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the modern philosophy issues in Hegel. Right. 
he's not saying there's six other possible turns along the way that where you won't end up there, right? And then he says, and Nietzsche shows that Hegel falls over into a heap, and we can't we can't live there, right? So th these things are decisions, and and he he thinks of these things which are happening in the history of philosophy as being not something where it's you know there's a thousand possibilities and you know we could take any one of them and it's just an open field and whatever interests you, it's it's much more. Um, if I put it this way, um, freightedly, fated, and uh, freightedly uh, um, at stake, right? Each individual link in the in, in those chains of thinkers matters for what's happening next, right? And uh, we don't get to undo that past, right? We don't get to uh, revisit it, right? We uh, we we only get to make the decisions about the real possibilities now, right? So he's not he's not a uh, um, a reviver of traditions. He's not studying all this stuff because he wants to bring these traditions back. He's also not just a castigator of them. He's not you know studying them simply because he wants to burn them down, as we talked about, right? He uh, he thinks that for the uh, intellectual life of the West to continue, these giant you know structures of thought need to be. Fully assimilated, fully understood, you know, fully realized, and then there needs to be clarity about what the next uh, uh, step, position resulting from that is. He thinks that's the kind of thing the previous great thinkers in these chains have done, right? Uh, and he's emulating them, right? He is not. That's the pleasure in the interrogative and the pleasure in the mutual surpassing of. This is a. This is a. Um, a joyful activity that philosophers engage in, right? To to uh, uh, mutually spur one another to the to these to these uh, achievements. Yeah. Um, Josh, was that? I, I can never tell if your hand has gone down or if it's up again. <laughs> <laughs> Just assume it it's always up, right? <laughs> it's authentic. I need an inauthentic and an authentic hand. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, well, I mean, isn't it true in one sense that? Um, Heidegger realized, and he certainly wasn't the only one to realize that, uh, in a sense, there's, it's a matter of attitude. That is to say, one can have an understanding of history in which one believes that it, that it is possible to reflect back on what we call another time without the very reflecting on it, uh, shaping what it is that we're understanding. Whereas Heidegger, I think, recognizes that um, it doesn't matter whether what it is that we're focusing on is, quote, you know, quote unquote, ahead of us, or whether it involves um, something that is supposedly behind us. Because in addressing what uh, anything that we are uh, attending to, we are it, it is intrinsically ahead of us in the sense that we're understanding it. Uh, with respect to and on the basis of the latest uh, way of, of, of understanding the world so that the history is history is ahead of us. Um, so I'm gonna partly it, agree with it, you and partly this because the, the partly agree is yes, it's always uh, a current understanding. The current understanding is not always the latest understanding. Um, what do I mean by that? It's, it's, this is not a theory of progress. Um, the, 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 uh, the thing that is necessary for a next step to be a uh, authentic and uh, fruitful step, from Heidegger's point of view, is entirely is deeply connected with whether or not the 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 full understanding of the past, the full fruit of the past, has been truly assimilated or not. Right? You you the the, the reactions that haven't fully assimilated are shallow ones, and they don't take. Right? When he talks about the blather since Hegel, right? He's saying that those things aren't going to move the needle. They're not going to change anything, right? The the the, the stuff that matters since Hegel is the you know the, the the Kierkegaards and the Nietzsches that are not willing to go to the Hegelian place and have you know relatively deep reasons for doing so that are explaining to a large numbers of people whatever reason, right? Uh, that moves the needle. The academic stuff doesn't, right? So it's this is not a theory of progress, but it doesn't have a dis differentiation of weight of assimilation in it. So. I, I, I agree with the thrust what you're saying, but I'm just trying to avoid this latest as though 
whatever is up to date is going to be the thing which is doing the filtering of the past. The thing that counts as up to date is the deepest achieved understanding of the past. That's what's up to date. In terms of a content, in terms of specific information, or in terms of um, in terms having, of in terms of attunement to truth and attunement to the problems in the in the actual field, in this case, philosophy, history of philosophy. He talks about the the, the the need to refound philosophy in a way that isn't dependent upon the previous understanding of metaphysics, but it's still going to be philosophy, okay. right? The, the, the point is that, um, yeah, it's not about, it's certainly not about information content when I say deepest. It, it, it's about uh, the, 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 the depth of full assimilation in it. The, the, the point of this is, is that the shallow adaptations or the shallow um, reprocessings or the overly filtered ones from a, some you know contemporary point of view that's you know trying to reinterpret the past. You know, he gives uh, five examples, ten examples in this in this chapter. The the the, the biologists or the uh, positivists with their fads, right? And they're not going to move the needle. They're not going to make a difference. It's too shallow. It won't last, right? The the it requires a uh, a depth of engagement that equals the depth of the tradition to move anything this. Um, with this much momentum, with this much ballast, with this much gravitas under the surface. You don't steer an iceberg with a toothpick, right? You need to get down as deep as the, under the water as the iceberg goes. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so I got some of those basic things. I wanted to talk about the, the not a counter movement stuff. Oh, sorry, Isabel has a question or thought. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I had to, uh, my computer froze totally. Um, oh, I think I hope, um, is it that you were just saying, yes. Uh, is that why he says in his interview with the, uh, with the German newspaper, only a God can save us? I think we'll get to that stuff toward the end. And uh, that's some of the stuff that Dan was talking about towards the very, very end of all this, because there's uh, uh, he, he's going to talk about the uh, uh, you know the, the possible the possible arising or absconding of the last god and this sort of stuff at the very end of the book. But let's let's finish the whole book before we get to that question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and Jason, can I just quickly bring up one other thing that um, I I just want to sort of keep in mind uh, as we proceed, maybe even if we don't sort of address it now. But um, I keep thinking of this, you know, this uh, withdrawal from beings. And not, as he said, not as a, a sort of a Buddhism or a withdrawal into nothingness, but rather as a, a reorientation back upon sort of the primordial opening of unconcealment. And when I think about what that is, I think about Dasein. And Dasein, to me, I, I, I always have trouble making the connection between sort of like the individual Dasein, sort of like the the real, um, you know, the site, the actual site of sort of noetic intuition, as you talk about it, mm -hmm. um, the real concrete primordial sort of ecstatic horizon that is the individual Dasein, right? Mm -hmm. that, that that is sort of where human being and being meet to allow beings to show up, right, in the, in the field of unconcealedness. So mm -hmm. in that sense, he's, he's trying to point back to um, that sort of temporal opening and yet somehow this is related I don't want to be too think of it as too much of an individual sort of perspectival thing because it's he's thinking of it in this larger historical sense and I think somehow like I need to I need to think more deeply about you know there's those sections in being in time where he he links the concept of primordial temporality to historicity. And he says that in some sense, uh, the primordial temporality is like the condition of the possibility of the historicity. Um, and that, um, that I'm not quite clear about that yet. Um, I'm trying to- yeah, that, And that's a very Kantian about, formulation, by the way, which is you know not really his own, but yeah, keep going. Uh, the condition of the possibility. Uh, exactly, yes. Exactly. Um, yes. Yeah. So I'm, and, and I can understand, of course, the individual Dasein is 
you know, is thrown, right? Of course, we, we are historical to the core on Heidegger's view that um, our, we are sort of pushed along by our, you know, our history, our thrownness, that there's a kind of cultural memory that, that we are to some extent. Um, so yeah, anyway, just when we were talking there about Heidegger's view of history and what he thinks he's doing and relating to the past, I just, I, I feel like there is a, a really deep kind of, um, there so is you're a right deep, that, if I may, yeah, you, you're, right, you're, you're, you're right that the issue of, I'm gonna put it this way, the multiplicity of Dasein and its meanings is something you should be thinking about and asking yourself about carefully here, but I wanna possibly blow your mind with another one which is, is another version of Dasein being referred to here by Heidegger, which is the discovery of it as a term. There's arriving at the insight that Dasein is the between, right? That is something that happened not every time a human being stands before a tree in bloom, but happened exactly once in one philosopher's life while he was writing a book. That philosopher being Heidegger. Heidegger, and, yes. And being in time. Okay. Dasein had to be discovered. Yeah. Dasein has a history. Dasein is part of the appearing of truth, not just in the sense that it is the place or site where being happens, but that the notion that there is such a thing as a place or site that being happens that should be called a kind of their being, which is a kind of being, is itself a discovery that was made at a time in a place with a history, with a background, it's part of the story. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I know, I mean, there's one passage in this interplay chapter where he refers to Greek Dasein, right? So there he's sort of using Dasein in the more collective yeah. historical sense. And I gotta tell you, sometimes that's because Dasein in German also just means existence. And so you can say Greek existence. And oh, that's it does, true. And it does mean how the Greeks lived, Yeah. right? But I'm telling you that mostly Heidegger uses Dasein as the term that is just the, um, I'll put it this way, no, just is not the right word, um, performing the role that it has in the structure of his explanation of how uh, uh, a being essentially occurs and truth happens, right? That structural meaning it has in his philosophy. Sometimes he's talking about you. And sometimes he's talking about something he discovered. So yeah, it's, and, like, it's like Heidegger is introducing he he himself in being in time sort of opened up a, a momentous decision in the history yes. of Western Dasein, where yes. now Dasein is is has a been a possibility appeared. Yeah, that before okay. was closed off. Yeah, at the time of Hegel. That possibility wasn't there. Now it is. A decision yeah. occurred that made that happen. Which that's, seems right, honestly. I mean, Heidegger was so part, original. That, my point is, that's part of how being essentially occurs. Right? Personally, individually, in time, like that. And that the, the understanding of being which is sort of uh, epochal, if we if we could use that word, yes. um, that that is part of it, and that yeah, and Heidegger has sort of introduced a new a new decision there, right? And others can take that decision and run with it. This is something he has given to others. It's not an exclusive possession. It's part of a being with. It's a possibility that's open for Western men generally now, right? But it still is an occurrence that it happened. And when we're talking about things like the leap, and we're talking about things like the other beginning, and we're talking about those who live on the other side of that distinction, we're going to be talking about people and choices they make and thoughts they have, right? And the leap can be a just a generic term for something that might happen to someone else somewhere, but Heidegger wouldn't be Heidegger if that was the leap he cared about. He cares about the leap he made or the leap you're going to make, or he's not Heidegger. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's helpful. Great. Dan? Yeah, I think 
Heidegger never referred in his books, but privately he always says something like the, the being took over him. It's like the being is talking with me and that's my destiny and I need to do this. There is no way around it. So it's something like, and that's to him, like goes back, this is his story also. Sure. I mean, this is the point. It makes that uh, um, the, the, we talked about this as a, as a, um, an appropriation, right? The, the uh, being appropriate stop sign. Uh, Joe? Oh, yeah. Um, I had uh, more of a, let me say, a poetic uh, impression to interpret this. Uh, we all know the dog sign is thrown into uh, the world. So I, I, I translate this into poetically, you know, so a baby wakes up, newly born, opens the eyes, begins to see light or something, and is, is making its very uh, initial a counter with being. And, and this, of course, is the event. Uh, and from that point forward, uh, that pure encounter, of course, gets all modified by, by uh, uh, models and, and learning that come from uh, other Dasaini older than that one uh, that is uh, teaching it or something. But I just thought that was sort of amusing because clearly this seems to be what you're talking about. And I'll just shut up now. So, so uh, yeah. In some sense, yes, the uh, a individual consciousness certainly always has its own its own arising. But when we're talking about things at the level of this history, it's not necessarily all of them. Uh, sorry, I want to get Josh. If he again, I have. I assume it's an actual hand, the, the authentic <laughs> Josh hand. That's the real McCoy. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, I. Um... I wanted to clarify something. Well, I don't know if I'm clarifying it. I'm just inserting my own opinion. I know that there's a common perception or a common interpretation of thrownness uh, and also projection. And in fact, I had this notion of projection uh, when I first read Being in Time, which is that it comes from behind us uh, and particularly thrownness. Uh, it's been you know, said here, for example, that thrownness is you know, the accident that we're thrown into that, you know, in other words, the events that accidental events that occur to us that shape us from behind us. Whereas I've come to see both thrownness and projection is not coming from behind us from the past, but coming from the future. We're thrown into a world which is projected from the future ahead of us, toward us. Not only that, but this is the radical part of it, is that this projection takes place every moment. That's why it's radically temporal, that the world that, that, that design is thrown into, projected, into um, comes toward it from the future every moment slightly differently. Um, so imagine this. So we're thrown into a world. The world is this this uh, you know totality of relations. Um, you know, and then out of that we understand individual things or equipmental contextures. Um, so those are you know the the things of uh, the tools and the hammers and 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 the, and, the, and our roles and vocational roles are, are, are all sort of derived from or they're thin meanings that 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 when, when we do think of our world in terms of these uh, particulars we're missing the richer underlying context which gives them their meaning uh, it's cut off it's, it's cut off from us it's concealed from us but it is what gives everything in our world all the so-called things their meaning so it's kind of a hierarchy. You go up from the individual thing to what gives it its being, which is the equipmental or use context. Then you move up from that to the totality of relations, which is what Heidegger calls the world. That that's and that's not enough, though. Then you have to recognize that this is changing every moment. We're thrown into a slightly new world every moment. That is what uh, the self's being for the sake of itself is. That's what Dasein is. It's this. Uh, that's why it's radically occur uh, uh, occurring. Um, so it regenerates itself. It's not a, a question of the baby being influenced in this sort of intercausal sort of a way by this world around it that it is affected by. But it, it's it's the things of its world hang together as a whole, and the world is redefined for the baby as a whole in a slightly uh, in a subtle way, every moment, um, and this happens. Differently. I gotta got say, I gotta say, I don't, yeah. I, I don't remember how it works for the baby. And uh, when I look at babies, I know that I don't understand what they're doing. Well, but I, I, I do know my own experience. Um, but I, I'm gonna 
mostly agree, but I, <clears throat> on the projection part, pardon me, I don't read projection as being anything like a projector projecting. Um, and I don't think a projection is coming at me from the future or coming at me from behind. I don't view it as coming at me at all. Um, it's, uh, to me, <clears throat> projection is, uh, it's how I am related to my own future possibilities to be, right? Um, it's it's the it's not a passive thing. It's not an undergone thing. It's not a movie I'm watching. It's the time piloted nature of I am surfing forward in a time space in which I am environed, right? Uh, and and I am doing the things that I am doing. I'm you know engaged in the activities and. Uh, pursuing the goals that I'm pursuing and all that sort of stuff. And all of that directing through that space of possible decisions is a, um, it's an ongoing uh, temporal ac activity, which is not happening to me, but which I am doing. I am the kind of thing that acts in time, right? I am a temporally extended thing that acts in time. And the the projection business is that the the meanings that arise and appear and shine for me, right, are related to the thing I'm steering, right, um, the actual decisions I'm making. So the the uh, that's what I take the projection part to be. It's that the the, the 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 it's it's a question of where the meaning shinings are coming from, and and the recognizing that the meaning shinings are not just coming from the future or coming from the past or coming from behind me. They're not just happening. They are. I'm involved in them. Um, do, you, and... do, do you, are you, is it a volunteerism or do you find yourself uh, being inclined or willing? Do you find yourself willing or do you will yourself to will, to choose, to, to decide? I think the will was a completely failed attempt to explain these things. And I, I don't use it. Um, I think that that's the, 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 the Thing which is, if there's anything most distinct about this chapter is that he wrote just wrote an entire history of Western philosophy, including multiple histories of German idealism, and and the will basically never came up. That's right. <laughs> um, and that's characteristic of Heidegger. Um, yeah. uh, but the reason is <clears throat> not that he doesn't think those phenomena uh, occur, but he thinks he has a, a a more adequate understanding of action than is involved in them. The will was based upon an, a fundamentally naive understanding of action um, and of how temporal the self is, right? Um, but anyway, that, that's I'm just explaining how I think about projection differently. Um, Dan? Yeah, related to, to what Josh said, and like in being in time, he used this kind of like thrownness projection and like the especially the other, like the French existentialist Sartre and so on, took it like meaningless nihilism and lack of meaning. And then by this time, he's moving towards like like uh, appropriation, destiny, which is highly religious and highly meaningful and stuff like that. And that's kind of like, I think he's, he's switching. It's, he's talking the same about the same thing, but he's, he's presenting I, I it quite that. differently. I, I don't disagree with you at all, but I'm going to point out all that was there being in time was already there in being in time. He was already talking about the call and the conscience and guilt and all, all that, uh, you know, all all that stuff in being in time. It's 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 not only there later. Um, okay. Um, I want to talk about the relation to the first beginning. Uh, and I was uh, about to get to some of this stuff on in 92. Um, and one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is we talked about the temperamental thing at the beginning and we talked about the you know uh, need, need for a new beginning we've talked about multiple times but he also he's he's concerned for with differentiating this other beginning thing from um a Nietzschean attempt at overcoming that he can see just got mired in what it was attempting to overcome and just copied the thing it was trying to reverse or a hegelian understanding of uh um overcoming as synthesis as you know um you know um uh you know, transcending that uh, he thinks is, you know, too, uh, I can put it this way, mechanically uh, progressivist, something like that. Um, so what did he say? He says, beyond counterforces, counter drives, and counter arrangements, something utterly different must commence. 
With regard to the transforming and saving of the history determined by the West, that means future decisions will not be made in previous domains, culture or worldview, one still upheld by counter movements. Instead, the place of decision must first be grounded, specifically through the opening up of the truth of being and the uniqueness of being, a uniqueness which lies anterior to all the oppositions of the previous metaphysics. And next part is first as something utterly different. It stands outside of the counter and outside of immediate comparison. Can it actually stand outside all counter? Uh, so all media, all, all media comparison? No, it cannot. Right? There's no way in which this other beginning is not going to be related to and dependent upon the thing before. Right? We can recognize this just as philosophers. No matter how much he wants it to be a completely new beginning, it's going to still be informed by what came before. Right? But it's not an opposition, not a crude rejection, not a sublation of the first. It has to be on the basis of, of genuine originality, procuring for the first beginning the truth of its history, and thereby its inalienable most proper otherness, which becomes fruitful only in historical dialogues of thinkers. And then he goes on to the dialogues with the great thinkers. What's the point of that? The point of that is he's trying to say the other beginning has to be original in a way that fully understands and respects what was unique in the first beginning. Right? There's no independence for the other beginning unless it undistortedly, faithfully understands the past, right? You can't, you can't change the future by raising the past is the fundamental idea of this thought, of this, of this passage. But on the idea that what can arise afterwards can be utterly different, it can't be, I'm just telling you. You can want it to be, it's not gonna be. Some of what happened to Nietzsche will happen to Heidegger in the sense that what he uh, 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 thinks he is uh, striving against or thinks that he is opposing is going to, by that very fact, um, uh, affect for good as well as ill um, uh, where he goes, what he comes out with. He will, if, if Nietzsche was too um, passionately willful, uh, Heidegger will be too uh, uh, quietus and waiting, right? And for no other reason that he is trying to not commit Nietzsche's mistake, he will be informed and shaped by Nietzsche's mistake, right? There's no getting around that. It's part of being in history. Josh. Heidegger, Heidegger seems to understand that um, in, in, not in this chapter, but in other places where uh, in his writings around the same time where he is just also discussing, um, you know, his notion of the epicality of being, and when he, he talks about sort of the, you know, sort of the trajectory of um, uh, of history, you know, of, from the Greeks up to the medieval era, and then to the to modern, uh, you know, uh, uh, German idealism, etc. Um, he he talks about it, you know. He wants to make clear that he he's not accepting the Hegelian notion of a kind of a dialectical uh, history, but um, but he's 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 also not talking about this 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 movement in terms of a kind of an absolute well certainly not in terms of any kind of break from one period to the next but then of course that's all taking place within what he's now talking about as you know as as the first beginning but I think even what, what goes from one period to the next or one epoch to the next within the first beginning, I think also applies, I, I think for Heidegger in the transition from the first to the other beginning, that is to say that it's not, it's not a dialectical move. It's not a dialectical opposition, um, yep. but, but it, it, you know, but it, it, but it can't, and uh, it, it also isn't one of, of an absolute, what, what does he, what does he say? He says that we just want, you know, when we, Get to that point where we're now, you know, sort of in living, you know, or you know, uh, uh, we are in 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 the other beginning, um, thinking from the other beginning. It's a question of not recognizing, not overcoming, but not needing the first beginning in it, not needing it, as, which is an interesting choice of words. Yeah, it, so which I, to, yeah, the point, it's a I'm careful, it, it's a, I'm, it's a I'm careful making, choice of words. I'm yeah. making a different proposition. Right. Okay. Which I'm not claiming as Heidegger's proposition. Okay. I'm saying that he's going to say things about what he wants to be true, about the difference between the other beginning and the first beginning, which may be structurally impossible. Right. 
he's going to have ideals of what he would like it to be like that may not eventuate and may not even be logically possible or structurally possible. But, and I understand why, but I'm telling you, it's, it's something in the nature of this sort of historical thinking in chains of reaction to pass, as opposed to just focusing squarely on the problem and letting the problem lead you where it may, that is going to have that tangled in the past relation. There's no getting around it. If you're trying to not be Nietzsche, Nietzsche is going to affect you. And if you're not trying to not be Nietzsche living 50 years after Nietzsche, you're going to be influenced by Nietzsche. Either way, you're influenced by Nietzsche. Being influenced by Nietzsche is not a choice. The only thing you can do is assimilate him consciously and, and, and intelligently and deeply, right? But that means that, the, that the, the future of the other beginning is going to be informed by everything that was thought correctly as well as everything that was unthought in the first beginning. Right. But there's not a but there's not any recycling. There's not any duplication or 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 a porting forward of a substantive content or meaning so from the past. I, I, I know that yeah. that is the claim. I am denying the claim flatly. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On page page one forty eight he says, For since Plato, oh. the truth of the interpretation of being has never been questioned. Someone tell Aristotle. Mm -hmm. there, there is more there is there is more of the kind of questioning he's calling for and more of the attempted refoundings he is calling for in the tradition than he is letting on right hegel wants to be a complete overcoming the past in exactly the same way that he wants to be a completely new beginning nietzsche wanted to be a complete overturning of platonism in the same way that he wants to found a new beginning right he's not the first person to do this move in the history of philosophy right and it doesn't work right doesn't cause a grand new era in which nothing, everything is untainted by the past. It, it, it's not that it doesn't work in the sense it doesn't progress the history, move things along, you know, it, it, you know, deepen our philosophical understanding of the subjects which it turns its attention to. It does all those things. What it doesn't do is refound humanity on a new basis in, in independence of the past. And in his better moments, he knows that. In his better moments, he says, you know, we have a very meager capacity to do these things. We have to be respectful of the greatness of the past, et cetera. I'm telling you that those sentiments in Heidegger are sounder than the clean breakism here. The clean breakism here is a legacy of a tradition in German idealism that, you know, n people before him in the same tradition had that doesn't work. Isabel. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm moving around, but uh, um, I guess I've been reading Heidegger too too long or been listening to about him in, in too many different languages. I, I just can't agree with you uh, because uh, just putting it in very simple terms, uh, the Heidegger is not asking about the what, what he's asking about the how. Heidegger is not asking the guiding question anymore. He's asking the Grundfrage, the, the basic question. And that the, what you were saying then is the, the future ones, even Turi, the future ones, are, are they futile? Are they no, futile they're not, then? They're not, they're not and, futile, but they're going to be informed by, mired in, influenced by the past. They're not gonna be de novo. They're not going to be, you know, uh, 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 new men. Uh, they're 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 going to be Western men, right? Uh, with with all of the foibles that, that involved in that, uh, they may be informed by these things. I'll give you another example, right? Um, the you, you're right about all the things that uh, he wants to, you know, change attention to. Uh, I know that the structure of the da sign is the structure of the between. That is the place where being can communicate with man. That's a wonderful insight. It's you know, gotten us past subject object distinction problems and it's a great uh, philosophical advance that makes it impossible to take lots of things in early uh, 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 early modern idealism. You can't take them seriously anymore. They're, they're, they're surpassed, right? It's, it's a great achievement. I also know that Plato was already talking about that with the metaxi idea, right? Or 
that uh, he, he's talking about the structure of the life world having the being with structure. And I know that that was already there in Heraclitus with the common, right? The, the point that I'm making is that, is that when, when, the, when the great thinkers are talking with one another, peak to peak, these, these dramas of um, world historical renovation that break the conversation into the before and the after and completely change the world, that's not what happens. They're still talking about the same zero problems with the same depth and care that that makes them thinkers of the same rank. And they're going to be in a communication with one another. And it's not going to be anything like after this, everything was different. Right? And we have to kind of rethink again what the difference between new and other is. I agree. I think that there's more continuity to tradition in, in in this than Heidegger hopes for, if hope is the right word. Christian. Yeah, so uh, let me ask you this, Jason. So, um, you know, when Heidegger is talking about the Nietzschean inversion of Platonism, um, and then he, he almost pulls a straight sort of Hegelian analysis on that and says, well, in Nietzsche being the inversion of Platonism, he sort of just becomes a sublated moment of, of Platonism and that both opposites sort of lose their independent meaning. Um, mm -hmm. And he credits Nietzsche for sort of even being aware of that in his own philosophy, which I think is correct. I think Nietzsche was sort of aware of that to some extent. Um, and Heidegger, um, he also seems to be aware, as you say, that he will fall into the same sort of trap, um, although um, I think you pointed it out, too, he is at least sort of trying to be um, self-consciously aware of it. I mean, he, he speaks of the other beginning as a repetition of the first beginning. And so my question is, what do you think Heidegger thinks he is doing differently than just a just a Nietzschean sort of inversion? Well, how is how right. is he distinguishing? Sure, sure how is he sure, trying sure. to avoid falling into the trap? What do you think? Right. So uh, I can get to the second question, which is a good question, but I have to have a reaction to the first part first. I sure. don't think it's a trap, right? I know that he may, but I, I I think inevitable things aren't traps. Yeah. Right. And and part of how this tissue of history occurs, it seems to me, is that people are entwined with their past in a way that Heidegger perfectly well explained in being in time is not optional, is not transcendable, right? right? And that's gonna apply to him too. It's gonna apply to his philosophy too. The same sorts of tissue things in the turns and twists of history of philosophy that we see where does Aristotle get Plato right? Not entirely, right? Is is the, is the, is Gadamer going to get Heidegger right? Not entirely, right? Th th those are what's that's the sort of thing that's going to happen. That's how these things unfold, and I think this is squarely in Heidegger's own problematic, his own understanding, and I think to not see that that's part of how these things occur is just is just backing away from the the the, the, the call face. It's not looking. If you look, that's what you see. If you see it happening in the history he's describing, you see it happening to him since he wrote, right? And and the 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 dream that the uh, um, change of orientation of the one new problematic is going to revolutionize all and sweep the world with enlightenment is a dream that millennials, millennialists, and Gnostics have had for thousands of years, and we've seen how it plays out. And it, it never just sweeps and changes the world. That doesn't mean it doesn't change the world. It's part of the drama. It's part of the story. But you should not expect that this is going to be something which breaks free of the tradition and founds a new civilization. It's going to be part of the same civilization and part of the same tradition, just like all the ones before it. That's to me just, that's what everything says. Yeah, Heidegger himself is sort of floundering back and forth between on, on the one hand, he wants to have this self-conscious recognition of 
yes, we are um, inextricably indebted to the tradition and, and yes. there can never be a completely a discontinuous break. break. Um, and on yes. the other hand, he has this kind of grandiose ambition. Yes. If, if only I understand them, them, if only I understand them thoroughly enough and move us forward decisively enough, then it will be the sweeping grand, right? And I, I can admire the ambition, yeah. but I can tell you which way to bet. Yeah. Dan. Yeah, I think it's interesting, like in ponderings, he says something like along the, li the lines of what you are saying. So he he tried to, to, to change the world and in the end he, I think that was one of the few apologies for his involvement with the Nazi. He says something in the end, I didn't understand what Nietzsche said meant by God is dead. So it's kind of like he thought that he overcame Nietzsche and in the end it's made the same mistake as Nietzsche or something like that, or was still under Nietzsche's influence when he thought that he got free. Yeah, I mean, certainly it can happen in those uh, sort of freighted situations too. I wasn't making that particular point, but it's a fair one. Josh? Um, Jared out said, um, there's a way of being continuing to be the same differently. And I think that that concept, and you can trace this concept back to Kierkegaard uh, and Kierkegaard's understanding of temporality. It's one that, 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 that influenced many of the post-structuralists uh, in different ways. This notion of placing difference as being more fundamental or more originary than identity. And the result of that is, is that you end up with an understanding of, of, of thematics, of um, histories, uh, of systematics in such a way that at the same time, at the same time you have an overall thread that has a certain kind of a continuity to it. And at the same time, you have uh, that this continuity is composed in and of itself of, of difference upon difference upon difference. So that yeah. you never on the one I hand- have, I don't yeah. disagree. I, 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 think, I think that that's, you know, that's it's sound structure, so to speak. Um, and put it that way. Uh, I, I would note that um, in, in our own reading, um, Heidegger made a similar point, not about difference, but about uh, the negative. He, he talked about the, the, the how the negative is underappreciated in much the same way. Uh, you know, there's only a couple of people who probably understand that under have that same um, appreciation for the negative as Heidegger does. But um, you could think of Hegel, I think of um, Dionysus, the area of Hegel, something like that. But before it was about um, difference, it was about the negative, is what I'm trying to say. But uh, yes, I, I agree. Uh, and I think that. Um, that still doesn't change the fact that this is a this is a tissue of a civilization, and I can give you other examples from our from our text. Right there's a there's a place where he's talking about um, uh, he says um, Plato's understanding of this thing. Um, uh, the only explanation for uh, why it was not challenged was that it must have been completely satisfying as an explanation of how beings are, right? And you know my ears perk up. The only way it could have happened, right? It seems unlikely, just mathematically, right? Um, but I go and look and I find, oh, actually, no, it wasn't that everybody agreed with Plato's understanding of this thing, because what's the chance of that happening, right? What actually happens is someone comes along and they pick a different knit with Plato, right? They don't pick the one that Heidegger would have picked, and therefore, the thing which remains unthought to Heidegger does remain unthought, but it's because nobody thought of the criticism right then at that cold, at that moment that Heidegger wishes they had thought of, or that he could think of, but it was because they were thinking of six others, right? And they were, you know, criticizing Plato on the ontology of where the hell do these ideas even exist, right? That was what they were focused on, not, you know, did this, did this, uh, uh, um, did this idea thing fully explain essence? Right. So the point is, he thinks in that passage, he's imagining there's only one way it could have happened, but the reality is way more accidental than that. And it's way more accidental than that for exactly the fecundity of difference thing you're talking about. People are going to differ from one another, and these things are going to take their own twists and turns. Right. And the, the reason the reason B B is B follows A isn't going to be because it's the only logical possible conclusion from A. It's going to be because there's going to be a whole bunch of accidental things about how that was the particular direction in which the criticism took. Right. But but what about the notion of the slippage, the subtle slippage of sense? For example, uh, in in uh, moving from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics, 
Well, a lot of the same concepts were, were, were retained, but the sense, according to people like Feuerabend and, and Kuhn, the sense of meaning of the terms changed in, in, in ways that were subtle enough that a lot of people didn't notice them and say, no, they're the same concepts. We're just, you know, changing some of the math a little bit, but we're, you know, we're retaining some context, concepts, we're changing others, but, there, but there's a way of not noticing that, that, that the sense of meaning uh, of the terms that we use are changed as a result of time uh, and usage. And in, in fact, this was the basis of the late Wittgenstein's understanding of how we understand each other, that we have you know, criteria and rules, but the rules don't sit there in the background waiting to be drawn from. The rules don't exist until they're actually used when we use the words. And when we use the words, we change the sense of the words right now immediately and well, so I, there's really, I get I get, yeah, yeah. I, I, get yeah. I, I get this I get the theory but I think that um the idea that these things happen either by logic or that they only happen you know at the moment with happenstance neither of them fits for me these things happen by thought often consciously but in ways which don't run on single track rails they they they, they have exactly this character of thoughtful decision that Heidegger describes but being done by not one person or one actor, but by many, and the result is not a clean single track, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 in, in synapses like this, we often are getting the attempt to put things on a clean single track because we're trying to you know, unify things explanatorily, understand it fine. But when he says things, when he says things like the Plato comment there, it could only have happened this way. No, does this thing have to change because of a, a subtle shift in meaning that people nobody noticed? No, it happened consciously because someone, because Philo had this thought, or because Aristotle had this criticism. Sorry, Pete. Yeah, so I just want to defend Heidegger a bit uh, in the radicality of his change compared to, say, Hegel or Nietzsche saying, "Oh, I've changed everything. Everything's." changed with my thought. Uh, and, and this is part of, I think, Heidegger's criticism of metaphysics is that Hegel and Nietzsche are still in metaphysics. They're still progressing. So Hegel's building on Descartes, subject object, let's say, or he's building on Kant's antinomies. And then you know, Nietzsche rejects uh, Hegel's systematization. <clears throat> but as Heidegger points out, he's still, uh, he's pushing against Plato, but in Plato's terms. Whereas Heidegger's taking it all the way back to the beginning. He's being the opposite of progressive and saying, Oh, I now understand the next stage and everything will be different after me because we've now moved to the next stage. He, what he's doing is radical in that he's saying we have to go all the way back to the past, discard metaphysics, reinvent science and technology in a new way in this other beginning. And that'll keep us from being trapped in the gestell because we won't be in metaphysics anymore. And yes, in reality, we're not going to go back to wearing togas for a while. Uh-oh. And rebuilding a new history. It will be influenced by the original history we lived through. And Heidegger's using it to understand what the other beginning will look like. But it's much more radical than, oh, everything changes after me. So I agree with you. It's not progressive in the same way. Uh, I, I, I don't know. that. I mean, I think that some of the ways in which Nietzsche thought that he was going to have um, major impact were probably more accurate forecasts of his impact than Heidegger's own, about his own. Um, I, I think that Heidegger's um, instinct to go back to the beginning, to fully understand the tradition, uh, is a sound one, but I think it's sound in part because it's the way to learn as much as possible from that tradition, um, not because it's the way to um, 
make the most complete change from it. Um, I don't think that uh, Heidegger's prescription for a complete change to the tradition will result in a complete change from the tradition. Um, I think that the evidence of that from his own argument and action is clear, right? Uh, if he wants to, if he, uh, um, yeah, I mean, and, and to, 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 in his defense, right, he is not a technologist, he's not an ideologist, he doesn't claim to be, he's not trying to, you know, uh, uh, found a worldview that is going to sweep the world, nothing like that, right? Uh, he's he's a, a quietist by nature, philosophical, he's expecting these things from philosophical action. I uh, think that that, you know, that uh, understanding of philosophy as actual serious concern with truth and serious engagement with these problems and serious respect for things of the past, complete respect for it, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a noble activity, even if it doesn't issue in any kind of radical change, by the way. Um, but the, the, as a prescription for how to found a, uh, a world reforming um, uh, school of the enlightened, um, I predict it will be slightly less efficacious than trying to cut down a rainforest with a spoon. Um, so, it, which is fine. I mean, it's not, you, you, it's, it's, Practical, ideological, political reform kind of action isn't a serious test, is what I'm trying to say. Um, engagement with the past in a thoughtful way is, but that's going to be because this will make contributions to philosophy. And it's going to make contributions to philosophy because if you do philosophy well and you understand the deep philosophers of the past well, it's going to influence how people read them in the future and how they understand them in the future. His own contributions are going to also do that, right? That's where I think he does have influence, should have influence, you know, most definitely does, right? But there, there are elements of the of the sweeping drama here that are just flat naive, and I have to call it out, right? Yeah, I think I think that's fair enough, Jason. And um, yeah, there's there's certainly an element of sort of grandiose, you know. Uh, other philosophers before him have, you know, thought that they would be this sort of paradigm shifting philosophy. Right. Um, and I, I do think with Heidegger, um, I tend to think that he actually did make some sort of strides toward a more proper understanding of being. Um, and, and it's interesting that, um, and I'm not as well versed in the history of philosophy as certainly as Heidegger or as even as some of you guys here. Um, but it does seem to me it's sort of interesting that I would say almost up until Hegel and Nietzsche, there did seem to be this tendency in metaphysics to abstract being away from time and almost to almost to see the two as opposed. And of course, that goes all the way back to the, you know, dispute between Parmenides and Heraclitus um, and Heidegger seems to think somehow that you know Hegel and then Nietzsche after him were, were getting back to um, maybe uh, maybe where Heraclitus was on the right track initially and then but somehow he thinks that he thinks that with Plato in the introduction of metaphysics there's something about that beginning which systematically had led to this effect of being being abstracted from time and he seems to see himself as sort of following in the footsteps of hegel and nietzsche and like really um condensing and concentrating that problematic and sort of finally lifting the the veil explicitly yeah. um so this is a great th set of thoughts i mean at one way i would put it is uh, Heidegger is definitely in the German idealist tradition, right? And this focus on the temporal and history is in the German idealist tradition. He's not the, the first person to bring it out. Uh, and, you know, uh, yes, Hegel is Hegel is, is a systematist in a way that Heidegger is not. He is a, you know, he is a, uh, thinks history has a deterministic logic in a way that Heidegger does not, right? He thinks you can have a final rational theory in a way that Heidegger is not, right? But he is also trying to put together something like, you know, a um, a story of mankind as the as the um, the set of spiritual and intellectual decisions that you know charted the path that brought us to you know what we understand as truth now, right? And that is very close to what Heidegger is 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 doing in in, in this whole story. 
Um, and you know, uh, Nietzsche is, uh, thinks that that is all well and good, but there's no way that's a rational process because we're not rational beings. And uh, it's, a, it's a much more uh, you know, in, embedded in, in the messiness of, of, of um, uh, natural history, so to speak, uh, 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 pro process and pessimistic history for that matter. Um, and he thinks he's you know being much more realistic and about the the human psychology and the and and and, and the human understanding of culture and politics is of how that stuff actually happens than than Hegel was, who was a you know from Nietzsche's point of view a um, a, a an optimist of a of, a, of the pan gloss variety that everything is rational, right? Um, uh, so I, I agree with all all those things. I, I agree that also that that's a there's a um, he's noticing that. Um, there's a kind of anti-Platonism in German idealism as such. He talks about that quite a bit here, about how you know, German idealism was trying to uh, run with something like the um, the thinking pole that was already there in the understanding from the Greeks and run that thinking pole through to the human individual and, and arrive at history that way. Um, and I agree with you that um, certainly in the case of Nietzsche, very explicitly so, and I think in Hegel also, less explicitly so, but still so, you know, becoming rather than being, being the place where, you know, all the actuality that matters occurs, you know, that's an, a conscious attempt to go back to Heraclitus and take his side against Parmenides. And that's a conscious anti, you know, Platonism or corrective of Platonism. Um, so to me, this, these are just lots of the ways in which Heidegger is part of the German idealist tradition, right? He's, he's in that tradition. He has disagreements with them. One of the things I value Heidegger for quite a bit is he's one of the smartest critics of Nietzsche, right? He sees real failings in Nietzsche that Nietzsche does not see, right? Uh, including ways in which he fails to, you know, gets, we talk about, he, does he get mired in the Platonism he's trying to overcome? And the answer is yes. And, and Heidegger's proved it. He's proved that, you know, some of the things he thinks about eternal return, his only reason for doing so is he's actually emulating the Plato that he is pretending to denounce, right? So, and uh, th things like that are very cogent, internal consistency kind of criticisms of of, 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 of Nietzsche, if you get me. So I, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, and I think all that is, uh, can that mean those things can, you know, have impact, they have impact through those traditions that they're a part of, because those traditions are bigger and important things. Um, I don't, I've got a lot of hands up. I want to, Dan first. Yeah, well, one more interesting thing, like Heidegger, what he's doing and as a, different from the other philosophers who wanted to change the world and everything. He's kind of like, he's not saying that I'm changing, like I'm preparing the field is more like, he's yeah. kind of like the, so this is, and then, so again, he's he's not saying this is going to, to change and be the, I'm going to bring the new beginning is only I'm preparing the field for the new beginning. And then another one is this kind of like poetic stuff. Like he says, like he's expecting the, a poet that's kind of half poet, half philosopher, maybe will arise and that's kind of connected with the last God and so on that will 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 say that saying I'll do that doing whatever is there and it's possible that a new beginning. So it's more like it's still in the future everything and it's still <laughs> It's, no, it's... I, I agree with you that these moments of humility are are endearing, and he, he does sprinkle them around, right? I mean, he, he's not he's not a a, a boaster, right? Um, in, in that sense, um, he's still gonna you know end up you know uh, um, declaring that only a god can save us in interviews and so forth, right? We we the, the, it doesn't all go away, right? Um, but I, I I agree with you that there is um, uh, prepare, preparing the field humility in him, and as as contributions to, to to the lossy things go, you know that that's fine. I I'm I'm with Christian that the way to think about this is to see what actual contributions he's making to our understanding of being or to our understanding of truth, and that's going to be the thing that weighs him, not how he you know tries to say he wishes the relationship between what he did and and the past. You know, comes out with exactly this formula, this much uh, acceptance, and this much overturning, and this much clean break, and this much. That's spin. The thing that's going to matter is whether or not he gets the, gets the stuff about truth right. If he gets the stuff about truth right, he will have an enormous impact as a good philosopher, right? And if if he just uh, plows the field for that, and people following in his footsteps do that, he will also get credit for starting the tradition in which that happens. That's how it's going to play out, right? It's up to him and his successors in the actual philosophical work they do. It's not up to how they wish they were related to their past. That's how I see it. Josh? 
Um, yeah, you know, um, I, I can't help but thinking of, you know, Derrida's uh, analysis and, and, and critique of Heidegger, because he points out many of the things that, you know, that we've been, and that you've been pointing out, this, this, this particularly Heidegger's tendency to fall back on oppositions, um, the pure and the authentic versus the inauthentic, um, the design versus the animal, uh, you know, the, the design having world and the animal being worldless, um, uh, the opposition between you know the first beginning and the other beginning. So all those things Derrida points to, but then Derrida then introduces this thing he calls deconstruction, which is you know absolutely completely indebted to Heidegger's destruction. It's it's, it's essentially very very similar. So uh, Derrida would would argue and has argued that he's basically Heidegger without these the, the, these remnants of uh, idealist oppositions. That you know you can have your cake and eat it too. That is to say that you can understand and 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 you know lift out from any sort of discourse the way in which it sort of uh, uh, tends to you know borrow from uh, what came before it and uh, without w- without without ever ending up with, with cut and dry oppositions. Um, and, and of course, the, this was this was typical of sort of French culture, right? Is is that they borrowed they they tended to um rely probably as, as much on Nietzsche, if not more so than on Heidegger. For example, Foucault and Deleuze, they both were tremendous, uh, yeah. uh tremendously influenced by both Nietzsche and, and Heidegger. But they ended up along with with Derrida to some extent, concluding that, well, that Heidegger might have gotten Nietzsche wrong a little bit and and concluding that uh eternal return was was sort of this um, you know, w- w- was sort of still elevating being or turning uh or, or turning making beings uh, turning being into in, into a being um now um now i th- i think from your point of view i'm guessing that what's problematic about the direction that the french took was that they um they would deprive us of access to truth um in the way that Nietzsche tried tried to do right. Truth is just you know fiction. Um, but so I guess what I'm curious about is I'm trying to I'm wondering um, who you would pair alongside Heidegger, either within continental philosophy or within analytic philosophy that you think um, maybe sort of um, is well go, is in closest proximity to Heidegger. Um, that might, uh, you know, who, uh, other than, well, you know, we know about the heritage of, you know, uh, I'm not, Hegel. I'm not, and, okay. I'm, not, I'm not looking for people who are close to him. Uh, I, I agree that some of the criticisms that I'm uh, making have been made by others. That's, that's fine. I mean, uh, lots of people can, uh, can, can notice some of these things. Uh, I don't have the same criteria some of them have for things that I would uh, uh, find as uh, um, Problems in them, although we'll, uh, we'll might agree on some of them. I think that, as I mentioned, uh, to me, uh, Heidegger is a very good critic of, of Nietzsche, um, and I think Nietzsche merits that criticism. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that he's not an incisive critic in some way for his own things, but um, I think that uh, a lot of the French tradition you've mentioned um, there hasn't absorbed those lessons about some of the limitations of uh, Nietzsche very well. Um, I also think they often don't understand the deeper parts of the tradition, the older parts of the traditions, back to uh, you know Plato and so on, the way, with anything like the depth that Heidegger brings to them. Um, and uh, that's something I definitely appreciate about him um, and find them unsound on. Um, this is my more general point about the you know ste- steering the iceberg. You have to go deep enough that you get to where the issues actually are if you want the change to last. The it's it's easy to have the the more, um, if I come to this way, the uh, more surface take, uh, but it's not going to have an impact if it's uh, if it if it doesn't get to the deep issues. That's also why I say that the impact is that uh, uh, anything like a new beginning kind of thing coming out of Heidegger is going to have is whatever it makes as whatever it sets off as anything like traditions about uh, uh, trying to understand truth better, something like that. Um, but uh, and I think it has it, uh, some of the in some of, some of those ways that uh, you, you've alluded to. We've both alluded to before. But um, 
Uh, I don't think that's fully played out. I don't think it's going to go in only one direction. There's going to be lots of people uh, looking at Heidegger for uh, ideas and influence for a long time yet. Um, uh, but I don't know if that helps. Uh, the uh, I, I agree that uh, um, plenty of other thoughtful people who have had have had their issues with um, uh, with Heidegger, um, including you know many of his uh, direct students. Um, we've already we've also you know read some other things in the group about uh, people not from his tradition at all who uh, uh, have different criticisms of him. But I don't know if that helps. But oh yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm mostly through. I mean, I wanted to. I wanted to get to a ton of stuff on the on the um, uh, history of philosophy stuff, especially the history of Platonism stuff. Um, I think that the uh, section one hundred and ten history of the, the Platonism chapter is is a, a staggeringly good little history. Um, I think that the history of the uh, um, of the German idealism stuff is also pretty good. But the um, in one hundred and ten. Uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, the um, uh, the fact that there may be other ways in which the, 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 this this could could have gone the earlier stages of uh, of all that, but most of the later stages of this um, history, I think he's quite good here. I, I just if you haven't if you haven't read it yet or if you didn't pay that much attention to one ten, if you want a capsule history of metaphysics as he sees it. I can highly recommend that section again. Um, the one place where I do see a um, uh, the 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 beyond being business on this is like on one sixty four. Um, I think that the uh, Epicanea uh, Tespasius. Um, it's the one place where I see something that he's doing there that he hasn't really fleshed out, right? I mean, and this is true even if you go to the lectures he's talking about, but um, just it's a it's a quibble with the with an otherwise sound uh, sound history. The other thing I want to say though is at the at the beginning of sorry at the end of it rather, um, it's clear that he is accepting an enormous amount of the um, diagnosis of Nietzsche for the tradition down to there down to as he's described it. Um, and at the same time, he is um, acknowledging that Nietzsche has failed in what his attempt was to overturn the, the, the um, uh, Platonism as he understood it. This is, you know, at the very end, of like 173. Um, but what's the point I want to go at this? What I see there is Heidegger accepting the mission that Nietzsche failed at for no other reason than it was the next step as it appeared obviously necessary to Nietzsche and Nietzsche failed at it, right? It's like, this is clearly an open possibility in this history because Nietzsche attempted it. If we would just clean it up and do it correctly, um, it would be a next step in philosophy, right? This is not a sufficient reason to do something. <laughs> so my, 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 my bottom question here is, my like, like question for everybody here is, what is Heidegger's motivation to try to succeed where Nietzsche failed in this overcoming of Platonism business. I think that if you're talking about the, uh, the, the understanding of truth and the history side and all the ways we've been talking about, um, uh, all of that and the Asai move and all of that would be fully motivated even without it. But the question is, does he still connect uh, Nietzsche's diagnosis of Platonism as a source of nihilism, even though he's completely overturned slash rejected Nietzsche, Nietzsche's own attempt to overturn nihilism and even his own understanding of nihilism. I put it to you that he does, right? That he basically has accepted Nietzsche's indictment, indictment of Platonism. And I don't think that his reasons for doing so, I put it. He's given us the reasons he's given for uh, uh, given for doing so are mostly Nietzsche's reasons, and he has been a very efficient shooter down of those reasons, right? So why does he believe them after he shot them down? That's sort of the question. And I'd love to hear uh, takes on this from people who are familiar with uh, him on on Nietzsche specifically. It's it's the question of how influenced is he in his goals by Nietzsche. I think we can agree that in his in his uh, understanding of the actual problems of the philosophy, he is 
a critic rather than um, a follower of Nietzsche on these things. But uh, Pete, do you have a, or Peter, Dan, do you have a, or anyone, do you have a thought on this? Yeah, I will say something first. Like yeah. for me, I move myself, I move from a, I was kind of a fan of Nietzsche and I moved to being a fan of Heidegger. And one thing that changes is this nihilism and, you know, the, the, the entire, I, I felt like once I moved from Nietzsche to Heidegger, that that kind of was partly solved. And that was kind of like, and the, the entire modern world, it feels like it's nihilistic to me. And I, I still encounter people still in the Nietzsche world and they are highly nihilistic. And to me, kind of personal is, Heidegger solved that problem of nihilism. It's it's so, quite complicated and it's a personal level, but it's no, I I get it. So you're saying that as as long as you were still at the Nietzsche level understanding of it, of it uh, no matter what his diagnosis of nihilism was, you were personally in a nihilistic place, and that uh, after you changed that, you were no longer were right, and it was no longer that part of the problem. Yeah, that's fair. Pete. Yes, I'm not so sure about uh, Nietzsche's anti-Platonism influencing Heidegger. Obviously, Nietzsche had a great influence, but Heidegger's criticism uh, about uh, Nietzsche creating metaphysics, and when we read the Theotetus, it partly seemed to be that Heidegger was saying that Nietzsche invented correspondence as truth. Sorry, Nietzsche? Or oh, sorry, or Plato, Plato, Plato had invented yeah. in somewhere yes. in the Theatres yes, yes. when he's talking about um, Doxa. Yes. yes. Uh, and as you pointed out, you know, it's not actually there in Plato. Right. And, and so I don't I, see... It's in Aristotle, yeah. I, I don't see Nietzsche as that important to Heidegger's criticism of Plato. Okay, so I mean, I, I'm not thinking of just of Plato, but uh, the, the project he's setting himself. I'm thinking of like page 177, paragraph 22. He says, on the other hand, Nietzsche was the first to recognize the key position of Plato and the bearing of Platonism on the history of the West, the ascent of nihilism. More precisely, he had an intimation of the key position of Plato for Plato's position between pre-Platonic and post-Platonic philosophy becomes visible only the Platonic is grasped out of itself in a primordial way and not, as in Nietzsche, interpreted platonically. Nietzsche remained mired in this interpretation because he did not recognize the guiding question as such, did not carry out the transition to the basic question. Yet Nietzsche did, and for this, and this for the moment, has greater weight, track down Platonism in its most covert for forms, Christianity and its secular relations are thoroughly Platonism for the people. So there is their notes of agreement with Nietzsche on uh, Christianity, Platonism for the people, ascent of nihilism, uh, an intimation of the key position of Plato in in all that, even though he says it's an intimation because he says his actual reason for living was wrong, right? Because um, he never got to the core of, 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 uh, uh, of the issue. Mm -hmm. So the, I'm, I'm reacting to paragraphs like that. And the curious thing to me is if, if I had criticisms of Nietzsche that cogent, I would see them as undermining the case that Plato is responsible for the ascent of nihilism or that, you know, the other things which he says have greater weight. I, I don't get it, right? What what is he what is this what is the part that he finds so cogent and, and accepting there, even if he, after he's penetrated to the part of noticing that Nietzsche didn't get Plato right and wasn't even engaging on the proper level? Right. So so you know, you, you had a list of things, and you know, one of them is uh, Nietzsche's interpretation of uh, Christianity and Plato's sure. uh, I influence on that. I uh, mean, the Plato influenced Christianity, I think, is known, right? That's not a, I don't think that's a, well, I, I'm not taking that as contentious, right, is what I'm saying, but. Right, so I, I don't think Nietzsche's criticism of Platonism, it might have helped um Heidegger with on his way to criticizing Plato but my my sense overall is that uh Heidegger could still have the same criticism of Plato if he hadn't gone through Nietzsche 
Well, the, the criticism the, I see below, not, where, he, where he says that you know Plato is a genuine impediment to experiencing the leaping into Dasein, right? That I could understand he would land as his own criticism of, you know, people who are Platonists can't see my Dasein point, right? Okay, that's a perfectly cogent criticism to have of Plato as getting in the way of what you're trying to teach, right? That's different from, you know, uh, the Platonism for the people and ascent of nihilism point that Nietzsche made. That was a banger, which is why I'm reading this, even though he's completely wrong about why. You don't, you don't yeah, see there being anything what, strange what? in that? Well, what page is that again? 171. Okay. I mean, obviously, it was a banger. That's my gloss. But Josh, thoughts on this? Uh, yeah. You know, um, if, if you look to what Nietzsche understood that, that Kierkegaard did not, and you look to Heidegger's um, sort of ambivalent relationship with, with Kierkegaard, being influenced by Kierkegaard and respecting him, that then often saying, well, you know, and not knowing where to place Kierkegaard. Well, he's a Christian philosopher, a Christian thinker rather than a philosopher, and he didn't mean that disparagingly. So he, uh, but but overall, uh, or in many places, he comes down on Kierkegaard as being too still beholden to uh, Hegelian dialectics. And- um, Which I entirely agree with, by the way, but so, uh, but I just- I, okay. Well, or, or, I just so I don't think that's, to Nietzsche, but keep going, keep going. So, so I don't think that's true of Nietzsche, and that's certainly not the way that those that embrace Nietzsche. Oh, it's certainly not uh, true. Nietzsche is not certainly Nietzsche is not embraced in Hegelian dialectics. I agree with that. But the question is, yeah, all right. The so, I'm so, getting at is, what's slow down. I have to back up for just a second, right? I'm still okay. trying to see the connection, which I think you were trying to draw, but I didn't get between okay. the the usefulness or, or lack of usefulness or limitations of Kierkegaard and the usefulness or limitations or whatever of Nietzsche, right? I don't see any necessary connection between them. I can have because all kinds of I, all, all kinds of reasons for you know not going somewhere with Kierkegaard and it not have the slightest uh, um, tendency to make me go someplace else with Nietzsche. Because Nietzsche pinpointed nihilism as in, related to a notion of presence. Um, you know, the, the, uh, presence was death. Presence is meaninglessness. And when you have an absolute and you rely I, on an absolute, even in the form of a dialectical unity. I'm um, going to reject slightly because yeah. I think yeah. what, what Nietzsche actually linked uh, nihilism to was the idea of the true world behind the world is a kind of disparagement of this world and is a kind of disparagement of the world as it actually is. And that was the thing that Nietzsche disliked about Platonism and thought was the source of nihilism in Platonism is the the uh, the true world behind the world the uh, is, is is a fable and that fable is motivated by an underlying psychological dislike of the world as it is. That's what I take well, the it, well. What, what makes the what, the what makes the world as it is as a living world as a for, 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 for Nietzsche not nihilistic is that it's a world of becoming rather than a world of being. Uh, and that's uh, as far as it goes. Heidegger goes along with that, but then says, "You see what you're doing, Nietzsche. You're still holding on to a distinction between becoming and being, uh, and that's where you fall short." Uh, whereas Heidegger wants to place becoming before being. Well, I mean, what what uh, what Nietzsche actually does? Yes, he he has a, a tendency to start there with becoming, but in the whole how the true world became a fable aphorisms. He famously says that after you've abolished the true world behind the world, you've abolished the apparent world too, because you've abolished the distinction between them and there's only the world, right? So mm -hmm. Nietzsche is already uh, capable of, of taking the step that abolishing the true world fable Platonism, version of Platonism, does not result in just a becoming that is opposed to being, but results in a, there's just the world. Right. Well, no, 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 but but no, but this what's critical about this world is, is this world is always in a state of becoming, but it's not a dialectical becoming. Uh, it, it it is continually um, overcoming itself. That's what the continual overcoming. That's what will the power uh, and, and and its relation with eternal return is. It's the eternal return of no, the. I, 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 I understand that yeah. all those things are okay. there, and in, in, I understand yeah. that all those things are there in Nietzsche. Yeah. What I what I'm what I'm asking is. Yeah. What does Heidegger need him for? <laughs> well, because uh, uh, because that's a huge step that Nietzsche took, and Heidegger needs that step. He recognizes that step. 
uh, a, a, as being in the right direction, so to speak, <laughs> in a certain sense, um, but not going far enough. Yeah, I, I, th I think, I think all he needs to that is just to say time and you're there. Sorry, Christian. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a great question, Jason. And I've actually been asking myself the same thing. Like, um, OK, I can I can go along with all of the, you know, Heidegger trying to reorient metaphysics in a certain way. Um, but where does all the nihilism stuff come in and what's why is he what's the connection there? And I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out myself, but so um, I. I, I can see a nihilism thing from Heidegger's own point of view, the nothing happening to being version of nihilism right. that is there in the in the I can put it this way, the Fichtean to Nietzschean world, right? Of the 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 uh, reason made instrumental, no longer being concerned with truth, only a tool for power, only used by world rules through ideology, you know, uh, a man of war material. I can see a nihilism case on purely Heideggerian grounds there that would be a criticism of both Nietzsche and Fichte and everything in between as being the same thing of turning uh, uh, turning reason into instrumental reason into a tool that drives as a tool of power and severing connection to truth, right? And you can call that nothing happening to being, you can call that a version of, 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 of technological nihilism if you want, or you know mock nihilism if you want, right? And I find that criticism, that cogent criticism of Nietzsche in, in Heidegger. Um, so I don't think he needs a Nietzschean understanding of nihilism to have a notion of nihilism, to have a, a, a subject matter to criticize with it, and to have the area of its application be towards the very end of metaphysics, right? Yeah. Well, I think part of what he's doing with Nietzsche there is I almost think that he is ascribing to Nietzsche sort of like the first intimations, even though I think he thinks that Nietzsche got it wrong in some ways, but he thinks that Nietzsche had sort of the first sense that there was something in the platonic metaphysics that led to this machinational technological understanding so of you're being. saying he, he, he broke the crust he had a scent and you know but he didn't track it down and i have to go track it down something like that's that. what i think that's how i read it. yeah yeah. yeah, like like that's, Nietzsche was on the path, but Heidegger has to come make it explicit and so lay that, out for that, us what Nietzsche was really doing. That's psychologically plausible to me. The part that is jarring to me is that when I go to his actual criticism of nihilism, Nietzsche is clearly squarely in the middle of it, right? The, the nihilism he's in condemning the, in the middle between. Um, no, I mean, I mean the, the nihilism that 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 Heidegger himself actually decries is one yeah. that describes. Nietzscheanism well yeah yeah I think you're right yeah because yeah with Nietzsche and the will to power I mean it's yes. almost like yeah I agree I agree I mean the whole machination stuff we got in in, in 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 chapter two as what's wrong in the resonating right reads like this is what will happen if you actually live in a world that's structured by will to power and it won't look like what Nietzsche thought it's gonna look like it's gonna look like this you I know what I don't might be going I, on there I'm is, sorry Josh uh, I, I don't agree with that, um, and oh, I know no. that because because my interpretation of of uh, what truth means for Heidegger is different than yours. Uh, okay. I don't. I think Go. that what Heidegger means by truth is something that's not that far removed from what Nietzsche does, uh, and that is to say that truth is simply uh, wa watching how watching the becoming. Um, uh, I, I mean, getting right in, intimate with the very event of becoming, and, it's, and not 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 being rooted to a world that exists independently of, of, of us and, and, and uh, you know, I, so, I, so, look, that we so I, I understand what you're saying so, and the, the way, the way right. I would put it is just that, that that's just part and parcel of in framing as a mode of revealing, but that's not, that doesn't get rid of the fact that, you know, um, Heidegger, when he's criticizing in framing and the, and the technological world and the machination world is criticizing a world that it describes to a T exactly how Nietzsche believes the world works. Yeah, but look what, but, right, but but look what, uh, but the inframing is, is is inadequate for Heidegger because it still leaves us with a, a uh, presuppositions about how the world works. Uh, and uh, when you- As long as they're Heidegger's, useful for our power purposes to Nietzsche, that's all the truth you ever get. It's just a lie that's useful for us. Well, but power purposes change themselves. They're not- Of we course, and, we and, and man is ordered into his, into in framing from out of what is he is so ordered, he is ordered to it by, you know, that all of this is, again, I, 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 there's, to me, it's very clear 
that the whole uh, criticism of modern machination, technological uh, uh, nihilism is directed. It's not even that it coincides with, you know, by accident or something. It is directed at the at the Nietzschean world. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Right. But 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 what makes it nihilistic it is is that well? I mean, all right. So it makes well, it nihilistic. I agree that nothing is happening to being, and 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 that uh, and that uh, uh, man is becoming uh, uh, mere raw material himself instead of the steward of being. Um, yes, but but Black still, letter. I mean, but, uh, but you know, I, I think to the, to the extent that he was that I think he was unfair to, to Nietzsche, or you don't get a clear sense that. It, <sighs> The will that wills does, doesn't will whatever it wills it, it is not maintained is not frozen in place. I mean, the, the the willer overcomes itself or is. I mean, there's this tension within the whole psyche for Nietzsche. I mean, it's forces combined no, against I, I, forces. I, I, we, 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 I think most people on this call understand the Nietzschean philosophy perfectly well, uh, and we 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 know how it's supposed to work. But we also have read all the parts in Heidegger where he talks about, you know, the will to will and the, and the, and the self overpowering, overpowering, whose only motive is power and, and how empty that is. It's there in the Nietzsche lectures. It's, it's, it's there in the uh, concerning technology, right? There's, but it, but there's it's, no question, it's, it's, there's no it's, question it's, what's, it's there. Excuse it's, me, it's, excuse it's, me, it's, excuse oh, me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. There is no question whatsoever that Heidegger is intentionally putting Nietzsche in the box he is condemning as this is Western nihilism at the end of metaphysics. This is not something that's like contentious. This is not something which is like, you know, people disagree on this point or something. This is obvious. If you can read the text, if you pay any attention to what the two philosophers are saying, if you read the Nietzsche lectures, right, he is not endorsing Nietzsche on the point. He is condemning Nietzsche on the point. What, what, do, you, what do you think from Heidegger's point of view is required to rescue us from nihilism? What is it about truth that rescues it from nihilism in your point of view and, and, and your opinion for Heidegger? man has to have the relation to being of holding himself open to the truth of being as much as he can. He has to take on the calling to be the steward of the truth of being. He has to pay attention to truth in that manner. And that means in all those things, it is not man and his will and his purposes that is in charge. It is listening to being that is in charge. It is a letting beings be in all of that, right? And none of that is Nietzschean. Well, I think it is Nietzsche. It just it takes a little, little longer to get there. You're, you're, you know, for Nietzsche, Nietzsche you're not letting anything. It. Nietzsche's not letting anything be. He's torturing nature until it confesses. Dan. Oh, no. Yeah. So, so Nietzsche to me was was a great philosopher, but he also more than that, he was a troublemaker, and he made as much trouble as possible. And and if you read, for example, Heidegger's notes on on Heidegger on. Uh, Heidegger's on Nietzsche, he starts very lightly, and by the end of the book four, he, he's almost depressed and so on. And I think Heidegger, more than following Nietzsche, like trying to, to follow Nietzsche as a philosopher, he's trying to, to contain damage, what, whatever Nietzsche did, as, as especially with the will to power and all the, the stuff that he... I heartily agree with you, but I also think he was massively indebted to him and learned a ton from him. And that's exactly the thing I'm bringing up as, 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 as the puzzling part. I mean, Josh is not wrong here to see that there's you know c continuity of thought in some of these things, right? But he, he, he is strongly condemnatory of Nietzsche at the same time that he is massively influenced by him. And this is exactly the kind of what's your relation to the, to the immediate past that's the subject matter of our chapter right you know how how do you uh, assimilate and overcome and 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 what does that look like right and and the 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 paradigm case of it is heidegger's relation to nietzsche himself right and i i think that uh he, he i think he does get clear of nietzsche i think he does stop being you know determined or influenced by nietzsche i think he uh uh to, to dan's point by the end of those lectures certainly he is he has broken you know He's broken with them, right? And he's no longer indebted to him. And in that way, I think that the the um, especially the Heidegger of the what is called thinking era is very far from uh, uh, from from Nietzsche on everything related to uh, truth and thoughtful memory and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and and the, the thinker's calling and all that kind of stuff. You, those are not things that, uh, that that rhyme with Nietzsche at all, right? Even if the uh, younger Heidegger uh, uh, might have at times, but. Uh, I still think that this issue of his indebtedness to him is a murky one because I think people don't just lose that past, right? They don't just uh, uh, 
yeah, you, you, you get the point. It, the influence on it is still strange. And the place where it's strangest for me is how much of the, the mission of overturning Platonism is something which Heidegger just carried over because he saw it as something that Nietzsche thought should be done and, and utterly failed to do from Heidegger's point of view. So, Jason, I wonder if it might be something like this. So I totally see what you're saying, that from Heidegger's point of view, Nietzscheanism is in a way the, the culmination of Western yes. nihilism. Um, it's, it's the end of met metaphysics because it's the culmination of, of metaphysics. And it's, the, it's not really the overturning of Platonism because it's mired in it. And the end result of it is the technological soup that all of chapter two is about. Yeah. So I wonder, it almost seems to me that in this era of Heidegger's thought, at least, he seems to be crediting Nietzsche with um, sort of a, a right diagnosis um, of the source of nihilism in, in Western metaphysics. But then what is Nietzsche's answer? Well, Nietzsche's answer is to say, oh, OK, well, yes, my worldview is that um, everything is the will to power. Right. But Nietzsche's attempt to overcome nihilism is simply to say yes to that. Right. That, well, if this is the reality then we need to not. No, I, um, I, I get it, and, and we can we can all. I mean, we can formulate our different criticisms of of of, of Nietzsche at our at our pleasure. It's clear that you know, uh, but I don't I don't think that that I don't think that the diagnosis saying that the thing which is accurate as the diagnosis isn't quite right. I mean, I do agree that that's what he's saying here about that he was you know had had the intimation or something, but the the, the actual origin is not right. Right. Uh, the the mm -hmm. um, it's not like. Uh, in, in, in early Nietzsche, right, uh, it's uh, um, Socrates, the overly rational man, goes into the marketplace and the course of history is set because uh, uh, Greek tragedy is, 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 is destroyed by optimism, right? Is there a trace of that in Heidegger? No. Mm -hmm. Well, well, right. well let, me ask you the, let me ask you this, Jason. I, I, know, I know you likely say no to this, but let's say hypothetically, if you were to agree, just for the sake of argument, uh, with the idea of Heidegger as a radical relativist who says we just move from one truth to another and they're all fictions. That is to say, they're fictions with no real truth. So essentially they're just, you move from one appearance to, to a, you know, in other words, so in that sense, he'd be a radical relativist in the way that Nietzsche tends to be interpreted by many, not all, but by many as a radical relativist. If you could, just for the sake of argument, agree that, that, that the two have that in common, but that Heidegger is a different kind of radical relativist, would that, if that were the case, would that make it easier for you to understand why Heidegger <laughs> takes the position think, that he does? I think the people that think that are simply Nietzscheans who cannot imagine that Heidegger <laughs> is a Nietzschean too, because they're so Nietzschean, they think if he's smart, he must agree with me. But there's no sign whatsoever that Heidegger is a, is, is a radical relativist of that kind. Yeah. Zero. Okay. No, yeah. No, no, I, no, I, I get it. I, I just wanted to, I just want to finish with this one thought. I don't know okay, if you okay. read, there was a, uh, um, a interview that that uh, God, Gadamer, uh, Hans George Gadamer, conducted uh, toward the very end of his life, and he was asked about uh, Heidegger's relationship with Nietzsche, with Nietzsche, and he said toward the end of Heidegger's career, Heidegger, on a number of times, repeated to Gadamer the same phrase. He said, "Nietzsche has broken me." And, and you know, Gadamer was asked, "What do you think he meant by that?" And Gadamer what, wasn't quite sure. All I know, all all he. he the other intri uh, intriguing uh, thought that Heidegger had was he thought that Heidegger spent his whole life looking Sorry, for God. Gadamer, Heidegger. Pardon? You said you said Heidegger. I think you meant Gadamer. Uh, yeah, the Gadamer um, uh, said that the other yeah. thing that got it yeah, that, yeah. Re that really uh, impressed him was the other. So, but I thought that that was, that was very intriguing. That what what Heidegger meant by that that uh, that Nietzsche had broken him. <laughs> we'll never. We may never know, but <laughs> he. Who may, who may already know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so b b besides Nietzsche's influence on Heidegger uh, because of uh, Platonism and nihilism, uh, this isn't mentioned much, but Nietzsche's also very important because he kind of discovered the pre-Socratics. So Heidegger is in the world where deals uh pre-Socratic fragments has been published mm -hmm. and it's all available to him to discover philosophy before Plato. Mm -hmm. And it was Nietzsche who was critical towards creating that mm -hmm. because it was Nietzsche who, while he was still a philologist, yeah. uncovered the pre-Platonic 
uh, philosophers and organize them into some kind of coherent. And he wrote a little book on it. But if you've read it, it's not very good. It's not very good. But that was when he was a philologist. He kept sure. at it. And he was working with deals when he went mad. Mm -hmm. And if he hadn't have gone mad, it probably would have been deals and Nietzsche's pre-Socratics. So I just wanted to put in that word for the- No, I, I, you're, 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 you're right that he was you know, uh, instrumental in that sort of discovery. I just, when I see what Heidegger finds in the pre-Socratics and I can find them myself and some of the other just straight scholars on it found, found there, I mean, it's clear that um, Nietzsche was coming that at that when the subject matter was in its infancy. He did have the um, uh, the eye of a of a philosopher. Um, he, his his essay on uh, Heraclitus and that is by far the best one in the volume. Um, it's the only one that's like really weighty, I would say. But it's still very doxographic. It's very um, uh, you know reducing people to opinions and and it's. Uh, it's clearly indebted to the, you know, the um, the Greek doxographic tradition, um, and you know, it's just there, there's no comparison with the to the uh, the depth that that Heidegger sees in it later, right? So he didn't get the depth that he sees in the pre-Socratics from Nietzsche's readings of the pre-Socratics. He might have gotten the sign from Nietzsche that you should go look there, right? Yeah. But but he didn't the depth that he found there. He found there because it's there and because he could see it uh, because he was reading them a hell of a lot better than Nietzsche was reading them. Um, I mean, a well, hell of a lot better. I just, I just get the sense that Heidegger thinks that Nietzsche was on the track to diagnosing the forgottenness of being, even though Nietzsche himself maybe didn't realize it. And I, and to, yeah, to put the point sort of overly simply, I think Heidegger thinks that Nietzsche was on the right track to the correct diagnosis, but had the wrong response. To it that's that's Our, the i could i i can only get I, I can get behind that overall diagnosis but only if we change what the diagnosis is about from being about being which i don't think it was to being about something like uh nihilism or spiritual sickness of the west something like that right in nietzsche you mean as the thing that nietzsche had a diagnosis of even if the diagnosis wasn't right he was on the he was he was at least he was at least a uh a physician of the same disease who had, was trying to recognize it and, and, and explore its causes. It's not that he got the right causes. He didn't, right? But at least he was, but I don't think that that thing that Nietzsche was on the track of was the pre-Socratics. And I don't think that thing was the question of being. I think it was just something like spiritual sickness of Western nihilism. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, but Heidegger thinks that that's what Nietzsche was on to, even though Nietzsche himself didn't realize it. Well, Nietzsche That's, did think he was on, uh, he was diagnosing nihilism. Yes, right? but not nihilism as the forgottenness of being. Correct. Right? It was sort of, yeah, that's kind of how I Correct. read it. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Josh? I don't know if it's the authentic hand. Yeah, <laughs> it's, the authentic, it, 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 it's the authentic hand. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Were good. Pete, do you have more? Uh, I have to draw. Oh, okay. Uh, well, we're at we're at five. I should probably we should probably call it. This was great. I mean, I, uh, sorry we didn't get to do a round of uh, of final questions because we went so long. But that's just because it was lively. Um, I really appreciate the questions. I want to thank everyone for participating. Lively, uh, Josh, always good questions and challenge. I love it. Um, Christian, same great questions. Dan, always like your perspective. Pete, expertise, always welcome. And Joe, thanks for listening to us. And I hope we're helpful. Um, all right, and uh, see you guys all next time in four weeks. Ready. Bye -bye. See you next time, right. guys. Thanks again, Bye -bye. Pete, for the resources. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.